This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Call the meeting to order. Uh, so welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting for July 1st, 2020, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions in the Open Meeting Law, GL, Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Gray Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now, now take a roll, oh, <laughs> I'm doing good already. Roll call, board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself and answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burtwistle. Present. Maria Chow. Please. Maria, are you there? I am, sorry. No problem, hello. Jack Jemsick. Present. David Levenstein. Here. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Okay, board members. If technical uh, difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Sean or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will know if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment and I will see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period uh, and other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during any of the public comment periods, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and uh, can be entered into a search engine by typing https colon backslash backslash amherstmass.zoom.us backslash j backslash 97536445751. The link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which is located on the town website in two different places. One is through the calendar listing for this meeting from the homepage and find the link within the event details. A second way is to go through the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda link. On the agenda, there will be a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Uh, you please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called upon, please identify yourself using your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their uh, views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item three, is the site plan review public hearings. Uh, scheduled to continue from June 3rd board meeting will be the common school paving application followed by Amherst Media's SPR application to construct a new home office building. Moving forward, the slide will now show the agenda. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link. Thank you. So at this time, we're gonna move to item one, which is minutes. And we received through our email the minutes from uh, March 4th. They're the second time coming to us. And at this point, I assume everybody has them. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Barely. You're quiet. Yeah, I, I don't know where I went. I seem to have lost. <laughs> You're here, Pam. Nope, I can't see anything. Uh, go, look at the bottom and there's a little like zoom square or wherever and you can bring it back alive. You probably yeah, just all, all I see is the little thing at the top that says your screen sharing is paused. So hmm. I say, oh, okay, got it. We're good. Yeah. Good job. 
-hmm. Okay, so we're gonna have um, the agenda come up eventually. And board members, we are evaluating the uh, March 4th minutes. So I see David Levenstein's hand is up, but I also see Chris's. So I'm gonna call on Chris first and then David. Chris, you have something to say? I just wanted to say that the um, minutes that you have before you are have actually been seen twice already. Um, I forget what the first time was, but anyway. Uh, it was a good were, month ago. Yeah. yeah, it was several months ago. So um, what happened was uh, Janet McGowan submitted um, uh, edits, and then those were circulated, and then um, other people submitted edits, and I took all of the edits and combined them into the document that had Janet McGowan's edits in it. Um, so the things that I added are shown by track changes, and it should be pretty clear um, where those are. So I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, David? Uh, I, I'd like to say something about the minutes, but I, I move to a uh, approve the minutes and then for a, a brief comment. Second. Uh, great. Thank you. So I, I, I'm I think sorry, a lot. I second it. Michael. I'm sorry, David. Michael, I think. Thank you. So if I may. Yes, David, please. Hold on. Uh, a lot of effort has been gone into writing and reviewing and revising and reviewing again these minutes. And I think that, that, that it's. It seems like a lot. Some of that's mis, been misdirected effort, in my opinion. I think that that the following kind of guidelines should should guide the planning board in the discussions about these minutes is that we really should review the minutes for to correct inaccuracies, to remove statements of opinion, and to and to edit your own comments, not to put words into somebody else's mouth. I think that that's really crossing a a, a bright line at that point. Um, and I don't, I don't think we need to discuss this much further. So I, I, I'd like to move to approve these minutes and get on with the business at hand. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, I see one other hand. And if there are any other comments, um, we're in the discussion on the minutes, raise your hand. I acknowledge Janet McGowan. Hi, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Christine, for these corrections. I support all the corrections. The only two ones I'd like to leave in are the ones, the deletion on page 13 and 15, and they both involve um, priorities and, and for the consultants, like issues that um, Mr. Moore felt that the consultants would um, would be need for. And on page 13, I, I put down parking downtown signage 40R transition zone in IZ. Mr. Moore didn't say that, it was on a slide, so I omitted that. And um, and then I also would um, leave the deletion from page 15 where um, Mr. Marshall is talking about the need to have discussions with the community about downtown, if we want to extend the downtown, the you know, five-story buildings and all this stuff. And the reason I think that's really important is, you know, our discussion about the zone, zoning bylaw update was really rich. And so there was a lot of good stuff in there. But I know that these issues are really important issues to many members of the community. And I think that it shouldn't be lost that we see the need for a discussion about downtown. We need the need for consultants to help us. Um, we need consultants for the 40R, for inclusionary zoning, transition zones with the BL. Those are longstanding issues. And it looks like in the zoning bylaw update, we're gonna address those. And so it's not my opinion, it's not putting words in people's mouth, but I, I do think the richness of our discussion, and those are super important issues to many members of our community. So I, I thought those were important to put in. And so that would be, I agree with the minutes and the corrections, and just to leave those two deletions in, perhaps pointing out that it wasn't Mr. Morris' statement, but it was his slide. That's it, thank you. Um, I, I, David, is your hand up? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I move to approve the minutes as revised by Chris and distributed by Chris Brestrup earlier this week. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. So at this time we can take a vote. I have to do a roll call. Did someone second that second one? Yeah. I'll second. Second. Okay. That was Doug Is there more discussion? Janet, is your hand up or you just, it's not lower or? 
Oh, can't hear you. Your volume's off. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I think we're ready to move forward with this motion. Um, okay, so I still don't see hands. Okay, so uh, Michael Burt Whistle. Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. David. Approve. Doug. Approve. Janet. Approve. And I also approve, Christine. So um, that's unanimous. We've approved the March 4th minutes for the planning board. Thank you. Um, at this time, I will move to item two, public comment period. Uh, Pam, do we see anyone at this time who wants to raise their hand? And so I, I do see... Uh, I see one. I see one. And I just want to make clear again that this is only to speak on things that are not on our agenda tonight because we will have other public comment then. So if you'd like to speak on something that's not being addressed tonight on our agenda, feel free to have your time. So Pam, is there, okay, I just see that hand has now disappeared. Yeah, right down. I mm -hmm. see no other hands and the phone call. I don't I just know see. who that is. Um, Did they star nine or are we good? I'm not seeing a star nine. Okay. Total one phone call listener. So I'm not sure who that is. Um, well, if they didn't star nine, then I assume they're not wanting to speak now. There's Michael Liu. Okay, because we're going to need Michael Liu next. Okay. Uh, yes, we do. Okay. I still don't see any hands. Okay, I do not either. So at this time, I will move on from item two, public comment, period. Um, we'll move to item three, which we have uh, one, it was set for 632 and I have 645 now. So I think we can move right to that. Um, and I will read. Okay. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing, continued from June 3rd, 2020, has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-10, the Common School, 521 South Pleasant Street. Request site plan approval to repave the existing driveway and pave and reconfigure the existing gravel parking and turnaround drop off area, including the emergency drive, walkways, and other site improvements. Map 17A 78 RN zoning district. Um, I'll just look for a show of hands from the board members. Are there any disclosures? Um, any board meeting uh, members need to? I'm not seeing any hands, I'll keep watching. Um, and the next we'll move to, um, we have Michael Liu, who has come back uh, again. Welcome, I see you're there. Can we hear? Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you now. Welcome. We Hi, hello you again. Have, uh, do you have anything you wanna show? I do, I have, um, I, I'm hoping this will be can be short and sweet. I have one graphic to show. Okay. Um, um, and are you, Pam, do you have him as a co-host? He, he is a panelist, so he should be able to share his screen. Great. Okay. Um, okay, first of all, yeah, this, I'm Michael Lee with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, back for the Common School Project to uh, repave the driveway and um, pave the turnaround area. Um, hopefully you all remember what we had proposed before. What the issue that came up last time was the, um, we discovered that there was a, is a deed restriction on the main parcel of the common school um, that up, uh, for um, basically for a maximum of 25% coverage on the lot. Um, it seems like in, I think it was 2002 or three or somewhere back in there, um, the school engaged with the town, uh, or, or I should say the town approved of a change in the uh, deed restriction from 25% to 30%. And they had initiated the process uh, to change the, the restriction in the deed um, and paperwork was filled out. But for some reason, this was, was dropped or never followed through. It had to go to the state. The state has not yet um, 
endorsed the plan. So this process has to um, continue now um, and basically on, on a longer parallel track, if you will, to this project. But we have come up with a plan, which I'll show you shortly, that uh, complies with a 25% lot coverage um, because that's technically what we need to, um, you know, to have to, to comply with current um, legal documents. Um, so if you will, let me share, let's see. Um, okay, I've, I've put up a, a plan graphic. Um, can you all see that? Yes. So yeah. Basically a black and white plan with the uh, property highlighted in red. Um, and I'm going to start this, so this plan brings the lot coverage to 24.9% on this little note. <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a, um, we have submitted an entire set of revised plans, you know, with the, imperm with the permeable paving, basically. And that's the purple areas are shown um, where the permeable paving would be proposed. Um, we had come to an agreement with the town that the, uh, for the permeable paving that 50% of this area could be counted as green space and the rest would be, it, this is the concrete um, open block system. So the rest of it would be basically imper, uh, impervious with the, with the concrete. Um, so with these areas and in the green, you'll see here the, the elimination of these uh, six parking spaces along the driveway and re returning that to green space brings the, the lot coverage down to 24.9%. Um, and, and then, so that, that's the plan. And this, the proposal that the school would like the town to entertain is that the, the school is willing to do the, the, the 12, uh, 18 parking spaces here at the turnaround as permeable paving the fire and emergency access drive here as permeable paving. And they would like to have a three year window um, to do this permeable paving if it's necessary. Meaning that if they can execute the paperwork for the change in the deed restriction, then they won't have to do this drive, this really elongated driveway apron, which is in excess of a hundred feet from the property line to the, to the basically that first parking lot to the right. Um, Could you repeat that time, three Harry? Year, a, three, a three year window or an, a condition that if the, basically if the deed restriction cannot be executed within three years, then they will have to um, construct the re, or basically I should say reconstruct this as permeable paving. The proposal is to do that um, with, with the, condition of approval from the planning board that they, this be allowed to um, be repaved as you know asphalt but they would have to go back in and put in uh, permeable paving if they could not execute the paperwork in three years and the reason that we're asking for three years is because I understand I've been told that the um, by Kevin uh, Campbell the school's consultant that there is going to be a change in leadership at the school so there's just going to be a transition period for the the administration and board there, and that this would just give them a little extra time so that this, you know, didn't wouldn't fall through the cracks, um, and that if they had to do it in a shorter period, or um, what David Zomek had suggested in an email uh, with communication today is that a two, that be a two year um, window to get it done. Uh, the school is asking for a little bit more leeway in, in upping that one more year to three years. They had initially through a five-year time period to Dave Zomack, um, and Dave came back with a two-year. So I guess we're trying to negotiate for, you know, the three-year. Um, I don't know. I don't think Kevin is on the meeting tonight. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't see him um, shown there, but um, I expected that he would be joining the meeting. I don't know if he's- Kevin Campbell is there, I think. Oh, okay. um, can you move him over, Pam? Do you might be him? able to provide more information on that um, transition period if you're interested. Um, but basically this plan satisfies the current legal requirements for the lot at less than 25%, we're at 249 um, but you know, if they can execute the paperwork, then obviously this, the, the coverage will go up a little bit with the driveway being asphalt, but 
the school's still willing to do the permeable paving up around the, at the parking spaces and the fire lane. Um, the fire lane or that emergency access is something that's going to be hopefully rarely used. Um, so it makes sense to do that as permeable and keep it in, in a green, if you will, a quote unquote green condition. And the parking spaces, um, I think that the school realizes that that's a, that's a further you know, um, method of having some green infrastructure there, which is an advantageous and, and uh, positive thing for the site in terms of drainage, green space, you know, open space, et cetera. Um, does Mr. Campbell want to add anything to this about the time period being requested? I'm not seeing his hand go up. He is there, but um, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, technical. Hi, difference. Kevin. <laughs> hey, Mike. Um, I only wanted to to share a little bit of the just a teeny bit more about the logic for why three years actually matters versus versus two years. Which, first of all, we really appreciate that the town will even consider uh, an extension at all. Um, but real quickly, I had responded very late in the day to Dave to say uh, the common school has been in an interim leadership position for the last two years and it has just set up a transitional leadership team that uh, will carry it through the next two years while they eventually move to a more permanent um, leadership situation again. Uh, so that just two years puts us on the cusp from my perspective of them, them at that right at that moment shifting into this rather again transitional I don't want to say unstable but but un, uncertain moment and one more year would put it on the plate of a new head of school um, new leadership and uh, something that 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 would guarantee its its success if necessary the second thing and maybe more uh, near and dear to my heart is we're undergoing a million dollar or so renovation right now of uh, the school's classrooms, and uh, the school's been raising this money over many, many years, and we are spending every single penny of it. And um, the apron at the front is roughly going to cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of six thousand dollars or so. And deferring it, it the deferring it is significant. Um, and what I'm just looking for is a chance for the school to um, sort of recover from the renovation project to stabilize and to have enough time to start raising uh, funds again, should it have to, uh, you know, we not get the amendment and it have to do the apron. So um, I know none of those are, are good reasons from a zoning perspective or a planning perspective, but from an operational perspective, uh, they would go a long way uh, an extra year for the school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you have anything else to add, or can I open it up to um, first Ms. Bestrup and then the planning board members? I think that's um, it. We talked about other aspects of the project um, last time, the, the rain garden being added and so forth, and, and uh, um, improved ADA access, safety with the fire access lane that the fire department has always wanted. Um, so yeah, I think at this, you know, I think we're ready to open it up and listen to any comments, uh, questions from the board. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna recognize Chris Bestrup first. And then I see Jack and David. Uh, Chris, are you there? I'm yes. not here. I am here. here and I wanted to say that the plan, um, even um, with, even without this request from tonight, uh, meets the zoning requirements because the zoning requirements allow up to 30% um, of the lot to be covered uh, with impervious material. So it's really the deed restriction that we're talking about tonight. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. That helps. Um, Jack? Yes, I was just wondering, the, 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 the project is uh, originally accommodating a repaving effort. Uh, is that correct, Mike? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> so what are you repaving the entire drive? 
Yes, if you were in, it's present with, the, if you recall, the paving ends right about here, right now okay. at the end where these parking spaces are. So we're, we wanna repave this drive and then pave this, what is currently a gravel parking, uh, gravel turnaround and gravel parking spaces. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna better define where cars are, are parked uh, formally so that you know one car doesn't take up two spaces etc on the gravel and then the gravel moves around every year with maintenance and plowing and so forth um, so that's kind of impervious area on the site has actually kind of expanded over the years I think unfortunately yeah. um, so this is going to better define you know what's vehicle versus what's green or pedestrian so yeah so my question is uh, would you continue with the repavement in the areas that are, uh, that could turn to the you know, permeable pavers there, or would you not do those areas uh, I, with the risk that they, you might have to pull up the, you know. Right, work it was so, so if I, and Kevin, if you're there, correct me if I'm wrong, but the schools uh, willing to commit to putting permeable pavers in these purple areas here, the parking spaces and the fire lane, and right. deferring this area, to, you know, given that three-year time limit to try to execute that, um, the, the change in the deed restriction, you know, with the state. Um, this would be, if, this, if they can do this, this construction season, this would all be asphalt in the, in the uh, front part of the driveway. But if, for some reason they can't execute it, then yeah, they're gonna have to bite the bullet and and cut this pavement out and install the permeable paving. Um, but they've made a commitment to do it here up at the um, turnaround and with the realization that that's a betterment to the project overall. The, the dilemma is that the apron portion, as we're calling it, at the front of the drive is, is the most decayed portion of the asphalt. It's the worst section of all. It's completely yeah, yeah. potholed. So we're, we, we have no choice but to improve it in the meantime. Um, right, and just looking at you know what other areas could possibly accommodate it, it, it just didn't make sense to do permeable anywhere else. No. And unfortunately with the driveway there, you know, it requires that long of a distance from the property line, basically almost to the to the opening of the uh, that first parking lot on the right, you know, to be permeable to get that coverage percentage down below twenty five percent. Now, hopefully, we don't have to. You know, we can the paperwork can be executed and and everything's going to be fine and dandy and well under the thirty percent that zoning allows. Plus, the deed restriction would be modified or amended to thirty percent. Um, if that's the case, then you know we're then the site would be well under. Um, the 30 percent and I might add that I went back and did a calculation that if everything was asphalt if there were no purple areas and we kept the six uh, parking the paved parking spaces here along the driveway the coverage would be 28.9 percent so even if it was completely all paved with asphalt we'd still be under the 30 percent however we have this this you know this deed restriction of 25 percent now that is really putting you know a crimp in in the plans <laughs> but you know overall i think we're still going to get a better project if the school is willing to do the permeable up in this area thank you thanks i see uh david now and then next will be doug uh hi mike hi kevin um hi. Uh, i'm sympathetic with the operational concerns and uh and the goals of the project for sure but but I'm still trying to track track the logic of your presentation, Mike. And here, I think, is my question. So okay. you're saying that, as proposed with the permeable pavers and the the change in the to the to the taking out some pavement and putting in some grass and green space there, um, it'll fall. It'll be under twenty five percent of what would be impervious surface of the law, of the total law? 20, 20, 25% of the lot that's outlined in red. Of the, a lot that is outlined in red would, that, under this proposal, 
yep. be now, um, uh, yep. uh, be now, sorry, I'm looking at a different a screen, um, unco it would be covered that would, and preventing any, uh, the growth of any vegetation, right? So the, as proposed here, this driveway is under 25% of, yep. of uh, a covered surface preventing the growth of vegetation. But then, so, and that's the total lot area. Yeah, so. But then you're also saying that for the, that apron, that, that last little bit that connects to the street, which is currently paved, if that were paved, which you'd like, you're, you're asking us to approve, that would bring the lot coverage still under, closer to, it would, it would increase the lot coverage to 30, to closer to 30% of the lot. Is that, is that? Yeah. It would no, it would it would push it over the twenty five, but we we'd still be yeah, we would still be under thirty percent. Right. So, so as proposed, your proposal is to actually not reduce the impervious surface, but is to increase the impervious surface. However, a portion of that will be permeable pavers. No. Is that right? No. Go ahead, Kevin. If you have a comment. No, a portion of that is sure the the parking spaces and the the area for the fire truck access are per, are permeable pavers, and that allows you to do the calculation of either twenty four point nine or somewhat more than twenty five but less than thirty. Yes. Is it, am I tracking that? Am I following what the presentation is? What the proposal is? Yes, I think so. Basically, this plan that you see on the screen puts the red area, which is described in the deed, in compliance with the deed restriction of 25%. If, however, the zoning allows 30%, and yes. if the deed can be amended within three years, then we can, we don't have. We're, we don't have to do the apron, quote unquote, out front at the beginning of the driveway. But you're correct. If we if that area is paved, it will push the coverage of the red area over 25 percent. Now, if they build it, do you have that number, Michael? You know, I don't. I'm sorry. Twenty six point two. Twenty. Okay. Twenty six. Right. Twenty six. And, and, and you want to do that paving now because it, operationally it makes most sense. Right, Excellent. so you want to, you know, that's part of the pr presentation tonight is to do that paving on the on the apron, what we're calling what I'm, we're calling the apron, the last little bit to the road. Yep. That that's that makes most sense to you. If we if we don't approve the paving of that, then you the more expensive option is to do the permeable pavers, but that's the less preferable option from your point of view. That's right. That's exactly is that right. Exactly. That's exactly uh, so the, the, here's my confusion. So thank you for thank you for helping me follow for walking me through that a little bit more easily for me. As I read, I'm reading. I'm now looking at the deed, okay, and the deed reads in part. So subject also to a conservation restrictions, and then it cites cites the Mass General Law in favor of the town of Amherst, granted it by the grantor in, herein, requiring that at least 75% of the surface area of said premises shall always be maintained uncovered by any structure or pavement and in a condition suitable for the growth of vegetation. So I, and that's where you get that 25% figure, 25, you know, right. I, I, yep. I, I believe. Yes. However, I read the deed now and, and that seems to me to be referring to 75% of the whole lot needs to be, needs to remain, remain open to vegetation, which to my mind would include the buildings. Whereas your, and I don't know how yep. that, figures into your the driveway and parking lot calculation we didn't talk about the buildings but all the structures on the site plus all the current cur what's currently paved and gravel because the town considers gravel as impervious and the buildings all together um i can't i think 
the coverage on the lot currently is already at 20, I think it's 28.2 or 28.3%. Right. You're so already in non-compliance. We're already in non-compliance with the deed restriction. So, so you're including in your calculation the, the amount of the, the, the area that the buildings yes. and other structures yes. prevent the growth of vegetation on this lot. Correct. Okay, That's thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm so slow oh, no, to, uh, on the uptake here, but thank I you very much. I didn't mention it earlier. I might have, we might have talked about that um, at the last meeting. I don't quite remember, but yep, it, uh, I'm glad we can clarify that. So if what we heard from Mr. Um, Campbell is, if you do what you're proposing here, it'll be at 26.2 with the hope that within you're asking for three years that the deed would be adjusted to, to allow a higher amount and you could just leave it the way it is. But if that is not possible, then at that time you'll go into the apron area and turn it to impervious. Exactly. Okay, so that's what they're proposing. I'm gonna go, Doug is next and then I see Janet McGowan. So Doug. Thank you. Uh, my first question I, is for maybe for Chris Brestrup. Um, what is the duration of a planning board approval typically? Oh, do you want me to answer that, um, Christine? Yeah. Oh, yes. He's directing it to you, so go for it. A plan, the duration of a planning board approval is really um, into the future. Um, there's no you know, cut off. Um, what we what we normally say is a site plan review approval is um, good for three years, or excuse me, for two years. Um, but if you start doing the work that is described uh, within the application, and you continually work on it, then it um, can last longer than that. But um, I think what you're asking is would the site plan review um, approval allow um, a three-year duration to complete the work described? And I think if it's specifically spelled out in the conditions, it would allow that. But you're saying that if work starts within two years, we wouldn't even need to put it as a condition because as long as the work keeps moving along, nobody's gonna object. I think you would need to put it as a condition because it's um, deviating from what uh, the applicant actually wants to do. The applicant actually wants to pave that um, right-hand portion of the driveway. Um, and you are allowing him to um, explore whether or not he has to, in fact, um, create it as, uh, an imp as a pervious area. And if he does not have to create it as a pervious area, then he'll just leave the pavement there. So you're allowing him, you know, three years to kind of figure that out. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my second question is for Mr. Campbell. Um, you cited the two years of interim leadership as a reason for the extension, say, from two years that Mr. Zomek was proposing to what you are requesting. Um, I assume during the next two years, this interim leadership team would be actively working on resolving this question with the state and that you wouldn't just wait two years for the new leader to arrive and have dump it on his or her plate. Oh, on, on the, I mean, on the contrary, we, you know, it's in our best interest to make this go away as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. So yes, thank you. All right, and then you also uh, said that a couple of years in the future, it might be a hardship for the school to have to come back and spend $6,000 to put in the remaining permeable pavers if you were unsuccessful with the state. Uh, would you be willing to put up a bond now to ensure that the money is available to do that? Um, I didn't say it would be a hardship in the future. I said it would be a hardship now, and it might be a hardship, you know, a, 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 I, I simply wanted to ensure that it didn't become a hardship and it didn't become um, an, an issue of sorts. 
And um, I, I'd, I'd hate to have to overcomplicate this with, with a bond, but um, I, I, I'm not sure how to, you know. Well, I guess the question the, uh, sort of behind my question is, say three years goes by and you've not been successful with the state, how do we compel you to complete the work? In, you know, as, as shown that, here. I guess that's for you to tell you to tell me. So can I throw it back to Chris Bestra? If we put this in as a condition, Chris, what happens if a condition does not get fulfilled? Um, then someone can complain and the building commissioner will um, issue an enforcement order and he can um, he can slap a fee of I think it's three hundred dollars a day for someone mm -hmm. who's out of compliance with um, their it. approval. So um, so that could be a remedy. No further questions. That's a good incentive. I mean, I would say for what it's worth is that the school is uh, out of compliance at the moment, and um, in terms of best faith we're proposing we're already bringing it down from 28 percent plus to 26.2 percent to a goal of 24.9 so we sure are headed in the right direction um, of, of of trying our best to, to to become in compliance uh after such a long period of time thank you uh i recognize janet and then next will be michael thank you um i think i have three quick questions um, um for, for the common school folks or Mr. Liu. Um, can you just tell me what the process is for revising a deed restriction with the state, um, what the probability of getting approval is, and then do you need the town support since the town holds the, the conservation restriction? Uh, Kevin, I, you probably have some more insight into this, but the town has already, well, given its approval back in, in whatever it was, 2002, 2003, the paperwork was already started. Luckily, that was found, um, but it went to, I, and I don't know for what reasons, but it, it did go to the state, but they never signed off on, on the, um, the amendment to that deed restriction. So I don't, I don't know what the process is. I'm not familiar with that, but it has to go to the secretary, I think, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, because this is a conservation restriction. So it, technically, it has to go to the state to get uh, to be changed or amended. And for whatever reason, that process was just not completed. There, we have, we have I, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have some signed paperwork from the town already um, that, um, you know, that shows that this process was initiated. I just don't know the history, you know, from back then of why it was kind of put aside. <laughs> Do you, do you have any idea of whether it's likely just to be approved or not? Because part of me is just, you know, I'm feeling very flexible about your request, but I'm wondering if it's just easier to spend the $6,000 now and just move on. But I mean, is it likely to be approved? Does anyone know? I, we can't, I mean, we can't, we're going, we're, we're the little bit we know as we've, um, done our research here and we've been working as closely as possible with Dave Zomek on this um, is uh, we're, we're proceeding based on a couple of things. One is the existence of, of um, evidence of the town's support for this uh, and, and recorded and, um, and then conversations with Dave as part of this proposal, perhaps the one thing we're, we're leaving out is that the proposal um, puts forth that, that, that the school would submit application with the town's support. Um, so that is what we're, we're hoping and assuming will happen and continue to happen. And three, it's um, while we don't know the outcome, all of the previous documentation, which was significant between the school and the state, but ended up never being signed. I mean, one letter after the other, back and forth, back and forth in 2002. All of it led to the belief that this was going to be signed. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but the, the state, on the state's end, the state's position was, 
why do you need an amendment to do this? That was, the, if you read the text of all the letters, they said over and over again, why do you need an amendment to do this? We think this, he, they didn't say it's a matter of right. They did not see this as, as um, that maybe we were, somebody was overcomplicating this at the time. And then it just fell off the map. Nobody at the common school remembers from back then why it just ended, but it did. Um, so that's a long way of saying, um, we, ha we have a fair amount of belief that this is worth pursuing and that, and that it wouldn't take a long period of time to get an answer one way or another. Okay, that's all I wanted to know, thank you. Thank you. Chris Bester, if I see your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to let everyone know that I did speak with Dave Zomek today and he confirmed the fact that the town is in support of this application to the state. He also had mentioned to me previously that um, he believes that the person who was supposed to sign the document, whatever the document is, um, either moved his office or left his office, and that's why it was never signed. There wasn't mm -hmm. any objection on the part of the state. It's just that they never followed through on their end. So that's just what I wanted to share with the, um, with the planning board. Thank you. I recognize Michael Burt Whistle. Uh, thank you. Uh in, in talking and talking through the question of a 25% coverage and a 30% coverage, uh, which is apparently what the zoning requirement uh, is for 30 for a 30%, um, and this since this falls well below the 30%, uh, why are we concerned with the deed? If if as a planning board, our responsibility for site plan review is to make sure the zoning bylaw is is uh, upheld. Uh, why are we even concerned with this deed restriction? That seems to be a, a matter between other parties. And it seems to me we should simply approve the project as it's proposed because it meets the 30% requirement. Hmm. Chris, do you have an, um, any? Like <laughs> I'm what? not really sure. What to, I, I don't really know what to say to that. Um, you know, that's kind of my, that was my feeling uh, about a month ago. And since then, um, you know, there has been a lot of conversation, so I, I don't really know exactly what to say to that. Was legal counsel asked? No. But I guess what I would say at this point is, why don't you just approve what is being proposed and hope that um, the school can uh, manage to to revise the deed restriction. And if they can't, then the plan that's in front of you now is what will be built. Okay. Michael, do you have anything else? No, he's good. So I don't, uh, so I don't see any uh, new hands going up. I see um, two uh, members go, um, coming about again. I'm going to answer those, and then we're going to open it up to public comment. Um, so Janet, and then I see David. Um, I was just going to move, so move Christine's um, idea, but I, I think we should listen to the public first. Yeah. Um, David, and then I see Jack. I'm responding to uh, Chris Restrup's um, suggestion. The thing that, that I'm sort of wrestling with, whether I should be or not, I don't know, but um, is, that, is that the proposal asked the planning board to approve something that we know to be violating the deed. Sure, it meets the zoning law, zoning, zoning bylaw, but, but we're... And then, and then we're, and then we're approving, as I understand it, and it's a little confusing to me. Still, I'm not quite sure why it's so confusing to me. We're, what we're approving is the paving of the greater surface, which makes a lot of sense, but with the promise that if if the deed can't be um, revised to allow for a larger covered surface if the deed cannot be revised in three years, they'll dig that up, which makes no sense. Or, and they'll put in permeable pavers, which still we're kicking um, the question about whether permeable pavers is 
meets you know is is is, is not is a structure is not covering the the surface we're kind of punting that now nah, i'm willing to punt that i don't think that what but um i i just find that we're we're being asked to approve something that per that is giving the school what it makes sense what it wants with but maybe they'll dig it up it'll never get dug up so we're effectively approving something that we know to be contrary to the current deed even though it might be better than what's the current state well sure it'll be better than the current state that's why they want to do the improved project that, 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 that's all I'm, I'm 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 troubled by that I, I don't know if anyone else is that's it thank you i see jack and then doug jack Oop, i'm sorry uh, I was wondering, technical question for Mike, um, what pers what uh, factors apply to the permeable pavers? Is it is it 0% uh, pavement or 50% pavement? Or is, uh, I'm just wondering about that. I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part? I didn't quite hear. Okay. Uh, the permeable pavers, it's not 100% pavement. Is it 0% right. pavement or does it contribute? I think it's 50. We're, we've been, we've, with, we've talked to Dave Zomek and I guess we're agreeing that 50, it's about a 50% call it an openness ratio, if you will, okay. so that you can get grass to grow within those voids. And I, this, um, these pavers are used at Nine Research Drive, if you're familiar with that. Um, I work there. I work okay. there. Okay. Um, Three times. That's, Different companies. that's exactly <laughs> what they're using on the parking for the parking spaces. And there, there is vegetation. I don't know what they planted there. Um, it might be some kind of fescue or something, but they- yeah, you're talking 15 research drive. Uh, is it 15 or nine? Yeah, 15. You you're the right, sorry, sorry. I'm thinking of, yeah, 15 is the next building. I was thinking of yeah. the first one. Yeah, 15 research drive, sorry. Um, oh. But that is what they're using at that site too. And I went by there. <laughs> just to make sure, and there is vegetation growing in those voids. It's, it's not lush green grass, um, but you know, I think that would take a lot, you know, a lot more work to, for, with fertilizers and, and what have you. I think they've chosen some other type of, um, of like I'm saying, like I think of fescue that requires less maintenance, you know, less uh, watering, fertilizing, et cetera. Something that's a little bit more green, although, mm -hmm not really the color green <laughs> well i I'm, I'm sure that i'm in the minority but i've seen just grass work pretty good as parking you know emergency parking you know uh, you know most of the time uh hickory ridge had overlow when they were a functioning golf course had an overlow parking overflow parking lot there um and you know it's you know I'm just wondering if that isn't a consideration just to, just to to get you know cut through all this uh, consider you know just lawn as as you know like where the fire is that's never been a road anyway so I mean we all want fire protection there but I think if it's just lawn that's leveled and graded properly will get you to the same place um, anyway that, just some thoughts there. Mm -hmm. Doug? Yeah, I was going to just suggest, I assume we need a drawing to go with whatever approval we have, and that the, the drawing before us is not adequate, and that we ought to have a note around the apron area that says, this area shall be permeable pavement completed within three years, unless, you know, uh not required by the deed in which case it'll be asphalt i think we'll have that in the conditions we can, if, yeah, we, if that's what yeah. goes i think we can add that note on the plans um I, I, as i mentioned we did submit a full set of um uh, black and white site plans um with this project i just thought this would be a lot obviously a lot easier to t to use as a presentation tool the the plan you see in front of you I'm just saying that I think somehow we need 
I think it's, it would be useful and maybe I'm the only one, but I think it would be useful to have some plan of graphic, a graphic depiction of the alternate reality that might be the final result. So Doug, we can put that in the conditions and refer to a plan. It's however we write up the conditions. So when we okay. do conditions, we can, we can refer to a plan. Um, anything else, uh, if, Doug, or I'm gonna move to public comment? I think he's uh, okay. So at this point, I'm looking at attendees, and if anyone is here to speak on a comment or a question regarding this project, please raise your hand. Uh, Pam, I'm just going to double check with you in case there's any on the phone. Um, so I see one hand at this point, and I just, when I call on you, please say your name and your address, and um, and welcome. So I see one hand and I'll call on Kevin Noonan and I think you're allowed to talk. If you, can you hear me? Yes, I Thank can. You. Welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, my name is Kevin Noonan and I live at 36 Jeffrey Lane. And if you look at the proposed purple spur for the emergency access road, my property is right in the middle where this little spur off of that spur is uh, begins our, our property begins there there is a proposal that we only learned about last time you met <laughs> that they want to move the dumpster there first of all we don't know why it would be preferable to move the dumpster closer to the children's parking a children's playground but our other concern mine and the my neighbors on either side of me is that it's going to bring rodents and and we've had bear in the neighborhood it's going to attract more wildlife to that spot. There's going to be odor. There's really no reason to put the dumpster there rather than where it is. I think that the justification that Mr. Liu used last time was that it, they had to give up one parking spot. But the if you note the, the first parking uh, lot on the right, just after that area of the apron, which you were referring to, almost never gets used. And when it when there is an event, it's rarely full. Plus the old Hitchcock, Hitchcock Center, there's parking spaces in front of that that are rarely used. So it just seems to us that to be an imprudent idea. And we're also concerned about what might be stored around the dumpster um, currently where the dumpster is now. They store um, the, the material to treat the, the asphalt, the existing asphalt uh, for snow uh, during the cold weather. <laughs> they also have some other um, recycling there. We're just concerned that there's going to be noise when the truck, and the truck is going to come up that emergency access road and probably crush those non-permeable, I mean, those permeable pav pavers, because as we all know, any anyone who has a dumpster, it's, they leave ruts wherever they go. And of course, they always say they're not responsible for that. So we, we appreciate that the, we appreciate the common school as a neighbor. We, I've lived there for 30 years. Uh, this is not an MD situation. We want them to stay. We really value what they do. We're a little disappointed that they didn't communicate with us because uh, we had been asking for the last month to talk with someone. Um, but there's, in our minds, no need to put a dumpster right at the edge of our property uh, when it can stay where it is or be moved down to where, the, if you notice, just beyond that apron you referred to, there's a barn. And there's no reason the dumpster couldn't be put there if they need, if they need the space. So, uh, you know, we're just concerned. And then recently there was somebody had discharged either paint or something in that area. So we're worried that this is going to become an industrial area. Uh, and, you know, there's, I think Mr. Liu referred to, there's nothing but roots there. Well, it, the previous administrator of the common school, not, not the current one, on the guise of, uh, under the guise of uh, safety, felt that the trees needed to come down because they might be diseased. And when they came down, there was really no evidence that they were, but nothing has been replanted. And so that's why there's nothing but roots and the ground has eroded there. So, um, you know, I know that Mr. Lewis is referring to this as an improvement over what's there and that that would be true now, but it, it would it would appear that someone should have replaced the trees that, that had been cut down before. There was also a tree at the at the beginning of the, of the uh, driveway, <coughs> which um, was removed, I think, because it blocked the sight of the drivers, and there was nothing wrong with that tree either. So there's about 18 trees that are now missing 
and are affecting the watershed in our opinion. Um, so anyway, our, our primary concern is that please don't put the dumpster right on our property line when, it, when you have other options. And we're asking the committee to please ask them to amend this, this proposal so that the dumpster does not go there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I see no other hands. Um, so I'll come back to board members. Um, I just have one question. Um, so we're looking at a property in the red line. Does the dumpster need to stay on the property for that or could it go on to the other properties? Just wondering. I, I don't know if I can provide a, a full answer for that, but where the dumpsters currently sit, as you know, is right here. Uh, on, uh, it would be on your left side as you get to the end of the paved drive, um, right in this area. Um, if we were to put the dumpster dumpsters back there, we would, you know, we would lose at least one space, which is not the end of the world. Um, but it is, it has been troublesome and an inconvenience to get refuse and recyclables and so forth out to that location because they have to come from the buildings and somehow, you know, uh, get get the items down across the gravel drive, etc. To this location, uh, the reason we put it here uh, off of the emergency road is that um, since there is a quote unquote you know semi paved drive there, it made sense to allow the dumpster truck to use that as well um, and pick up the refuse and recyclables uh, here it's a much easier path or much easier um, task to get the refuse and recyclables from the buildings down this walk and over to the dumpsters rather than having to you know cross over the gravel area and, and in this case if it was back here they you know they'd still have to you know whatever cross over the um the pave the pavement um there there might be a couple or one or two other areas to consider i i guess i'd have to um I'd have to have a discussion with Kevin at a minimum about about those locations, but um, um, I, you know, Kevin, do you have any thoughts about that? Do we do? Are we? Can we make a commitment that we can not put the dumpster location here up against or closer to the property, uh, to, to the neighbor's property? Um, do we need time to look at that or? I think when we need time to look at it, I don't want to, I can't make a commitment, especially if we're going to jeopardize I don't approval in any way, because then that would, that would completely yeah. jeopardize our time frame. But um, Mr. Noonan, if it would be of any, um, I mean, well, two things. One, um, not being somebody who works directly at the school, but nevertheless, I apologize that you've been trying to speak to somebody over there and nobody's gotten back to you. But two, one of the parts of the plan that doesn't show up on here is that the, the dumpster area, unlike as it is now, would be enclosed, all right? There would be a, a, you know, a fence enclosure around it, especially on the back side of the property, um, so that, and it would, it, would be, it would be enclosed on the front as well. So uh, bears would not be able to get in there, but also you would not be able to see the dumpsters uh, from, the, from the rear of the property. So that's that's one thought. Um, the other thought is is we 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 surely would look at alternative options. Yeah, um, I, I don't think we'd want to move it further away. Barn. Suggesting the barn the barn location, which if I'm assuming this is the structure Mr. Noonan was referring to, I mean that's like you know double the distance of where what they're doing now to mm -hmm. haul. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever carts or whatever down the road, I think they'd need to get some carts and, or something. Yeah, that'd be impossible for the students to empty trash or recycling or anything. Yeah. And there that's is a, a hill. That's just um, too far away, I think. Um, I'm going to recognize um, Christine Bestrup and then go back to the board members. I see Maria has her hand up. I just wanted one quick question. Where the dumpsters per, um, proposed right now in the red line. I was at the site visit, but I can't remember what kind of fence or is there a fence? What what runs along those properties? Current 
oh, it's yeah. wood right now. I mean, there is screening, uh, uh, there is vegetation, but you, you know, you can see through the trees to, to the neighbors. Um, okay. Some of the neighbors have more vegetation than others along the backs of their lots. Um, but there's not a fence. Uh, there, there right. is no, there's no, I think there's one neighbor that has fence, right? See that symbol right okay. there? This neighbor so it's has the neighbors that put up fences. The school does not have a fence on that property line. Correct. Okay. Thank you. We are, we are proposing some evergreen screening around the back of that dumpster location as well. <clears throat> That's good to know. That's what those little circles are. They're plantings. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to recognize Chris Bestrup and then I see Maria's hand. Chris? So I wanted to suggest that you could um, create a, a condition that would deal with this. You could say that um, you would approve the plan as it is shown in this um, in this drawing, um, and then have uh, the applicant come back to you um, prior to actually paving the um, parking lot and the driveway to show um, where the dumpster might be relocated. And if it's not possible to relocate it, they could make that statement at that time, have them come back to you at a public meeting. And perhaps at that same meeting, they could um, come back to you with a revised plan showing the note that Mr. Marshall talked about um, putting on that area down at the apron of the driveway about um, you know stating exactly what was going to occur there and when. So that's just a thought. Um, does that sound reasonable, Mr. Liu, Mr. Campbell? I think yeah. so, yeah. Yes. It'll give us a little bit of time to discuss, you know, what we can do with the dumpster. Um, I have a couple ideas, but, you know, obviously I like to... Yeah, right. That, uh, Kevin. But that way we could move ahead with this, but then you just have to come back before you start. And before us... we start or before we're finished? Uh, before Chris, you start. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, I'm going to recognize Maria. Well, um, no, I, yeah, I, I just lower my hand. Um, I wanted to mention it's not shown on this drawing you're looking at, but on one of the drawings, it looks like the dumpster is actually about four feet lower than the adjacent property. So not only will I have trees, right, fencing they're talking yeah. about, it's actually sunken down quite a bit. So I'm pretty comfortable with the location because of the access for the trucks, the proximity to the students and staff being able to um, get to the, the dumpster and, you know, wherever it's located along that um, north property, it's going to be next to an adjacent property, you know, a neighbor. And so, you know, because the school sounds like they're being good neighbors, I assume that they're going to, you know, take the proper precautions a good neighbor would with their um, dumpster. And also, I just wanted to go ahead and move that we approve the plan with the conditions that Ms. Brestrup just mentioned about um, possibly locating the dumpster, although um, I'm actually fine with it as is, but it sounds like there was um, discussion leading to having that as a condition, as well as the condition uh, Mr. Marshall mentioned about um, noting the permeable, permeable paving possibly coming if the uh, deed restriction is not revised in the three year time period. So I think that was a motion. Okay. And that would be also closing the public hearing. Um, is there a second to that? Sure, a second. Okay, I hear Doug for a second. May um, I say something? Yes, Chris. I, I, did, I did send you some possible conditions in an email today. They're pretty minor, but you might want to take a look at them before you actually vote. Uh, I was going to go through those. I have them in front of me. Thank you, Chris, for that reminder. Um, I do want to go back to Mr. Liu. Um, Maria brought up a great point I had forgotten about that you had talked about, this is the last time you came to us, about lowering that, um, that hammerhead area and how low would that go? So would that set the dumpster down? Yes, it would. Um, the, and the, the reason why it's lowering, well, the approach to that area is pretty steep and the fire department has said when they tried to drive a truck there, sometimes they can't even get up that initial incline. So they required that the emergency drive be at a 5% a, a maximum slope. If we do that, it requ um, I believe that the, 
road is cut down approximately two feet lower than what, what the existing ground is. So there's going to be a, a, an embankment, if you will, cut around that dumpster area to be able to, you know, have it cut into the hillside, so to speak. So it will be lower um, in grade than, what, than, than the elevation at the property line. And I didn't check it, but I appreciate your looking at that, Maria, if it's about four feet. Um, I'm, I guess, you know, that that's, we'll take that um, bit of information uh, and, and, and run with it. <laughs> so we have about a four, four foot grade difference from where the dumpster is to the property line. So would there be a retaining wall no. on that L that's it's not just, on the drawing, but? We'd be losing some of the, uh, we probably have to thin out some of the trees right at the face or, you know, at, right at the tree line. Uh, but we are, again, we're trying to add the evergreens in there um, to have a, a more solid screen uh, visually to the neighbor, for the neighbors, um, if, if it's to remain in that location. So I, I can't remember exactly. I know there is a hill and you're cutting into it. So we're saying somewhere between two and four feet, you'd be cutting into that, putting a retaining wall, and then putting evergreen on top of that. There's no, re there's no retaining wall. We're just there isn't. a cut bank embankment. Um, so how many feet, two or four? Because wouldn't four have an erosion? No, not necessarily. You know, we, we can still do a two to one slope there. And that's easily managed, you know, with vegetation. Okay, that's true. If you plant things, that will help hold it. Um, okay, uh, Chris, your hand is up. Do you have any comments on oh, this right now? No, sorry. Okay. I'll lower that. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna ask, are there any other comments from the board? Um, if not, I'm gonna go through the conditions. I We did receive them today, um, late in the day, um, but there uh, there's four of them. Um, I don't know if you have them, Pam. I'll just so I do. so Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, ask you to, to stop sharing your screen and I can share oh. mine. Okay. Thank you. Stop share. There we go. Is that all right? Is that set? Yes, thank you. So the first one was the driveway and parking area shall be built uh, substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board on whatever date that is, um, and that's standard. Okay, so the second one, the driveway and parking shall be manage, uh, management plan um, and approved on, with the exception that the six parking spaces along the driveway will be returned to grass, which I think the new plans we have show that they're back to grass. Yes. Uh, the, the third one, landscaping, um, Planting plan, continually, that looks pretty standard. And the third, fourth one, okay, applicant shall work with the town to seek relief. The state from the deed restriction limiting the amount of impervious surface to 25%. If this relief is not granted by the state, the applicant shall install permeable plant, uh, uh, paving at the entry drive or the apron as we've been referring to it as shown on the plan entitled overall site plan option two. Uh, reduction of the impervious dated June 10th, 2020, within two years of construction seasons of the date of this site plan approval. So Maria, you made the motion. Uh, it was unclear whether you were proposing two years or three years um, in your motion. Sorry, I can match the conditions what it says written within. Well, these are draft, so we can change these conditions to whatever we want. So I have you in the seat now. Um, this is, and we get you can we could do three and then debate, or we can do two, you know, and have people talk. But um, we've been speaking about three years as the what was presented as the preferred time period. Is that the one? applicant would prefer three. They or, and originally proposed five, and it was countered by the town for two, and now they're coming back asking for three. Okay, uh, I feel like our discussion had. It as three, um, please correct me if I'm not speaking correctly. Well, I will look. So if, if you're saying the motion contains three, we're still in the discussion part um, of the motion. So if we just put it out there right now as three, and then uh, if any of the other board members have a comment or an issue, would like it to be two, they can raise their hands. 
Um, also, any other board members can raise their hands if there's additional conditions they want to include. Um, and Ms. Bester, please, if you've got anything else to add. Um, Chris, I see your hand. So did you want to add a condition about um, coming back to show um, potential other location, alternate location of the dumpster? Or do you want to just let that be? Maria. Um, I move we leave it as it's shown um, and we keep the condition as num the number four condition as three years um, as well as conditions one through three if those are um, clear enough. So that's the new motion is leave the dumpster as is. Um, have the four conditions and have the um, applicant come back in three years or do the work within three years. Yes, do it. And hopefully they'll hear from about their deed before then. Okay, uh, Chris, your hand is up. Is um, Do you want to make a finding that this um, proposal meets the relevant requirements of the section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw? And you're talking about all sections in that? I can't remember what that part is, or is that the 30%? Uh, that section is the section that we normally go through on a big project. We'll go through it um, line by line and say whether it does or does not meet that particular criteria. It's the list of, um, of site plan review criteria. And normally on a smaller project or a more simple project, you just make a blanket statement that it meets the, require, the relevant requirements rather than going through those items step by step. Because you've gone through them and you yep. know. Okay. Yes, then of course include it. Um, I'm seeing no other hands. So at this time, um, we have a motion on the table. We have conditions and a finding. Um, and we'll take a vote. I do see Doug's hand just came up. Yeah, I thought I'd second Maria's motion. Great, thank you. All right, I see no other hands. Um, Chris, I'm going to put your hand down. I don't think. Yep. Okay. So at this time, I will do a roll call for the motion. Um, lost my list. So I know Michael's on it first. Michael? Yes. Uh, Maria? Approve. David? Approve. Jack? Approve. Um, Janet? Approve. And myself, approve. Did I forget anyone? You forgot yeah. Doug. Doug! Approve. Thank you. So that's unanimous. We have seven. So I thank our applicants for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you all. all right. Thank you. I, I, can, I know you all worked really hard. I never thought uh, just some repaving a driveway would be so hard. <laughs> Neither did we. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good Have night. Good night. So we're going to move on here to on our agenda. We're going to move on to the next site plan review. Um, this is well, it is now 751 and in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 48, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-11. Amherst Community Television, DBA Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street, request site plan review, approval to construct a new building and associated site improvements for Amherst Media, a 501c3 educational institution under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw, BN zoning district, map 14B parcels 250 and 251. 
So first I'll just ask, uh, are there any board disclosures? Raise your hand if anyone wants to make a disclosure statement. I'll give that a second. Um, and then we will move to the applicants. Um, I'm seeing no hands, so I'm going to introduce, we have, I know Bucky Sparkle here representing the applicant. He's the engineer. Um, yes. Would you want me to give a, a history of the sure. first, or do you want to introduce everybody first? Um, let me just identify who's here for them. Um, and then, yeah, just, um, <laughs> I was going to say, raise your hand, Chris, and I won't forget about you. Um, just so I'll just ask Mr. Sparkle, who else do you see? Um, who else is here for the applicants? Well, this evening we have. Oh, you're a little quiet. Oh, so, we, yep. Sorry. No, this is good. This is what we work yeah. out. Okay. <laughs> I'll uh, raise my voice as best I can. Normally, this works just fine. Is that better? Yeah, you're a little quiet. Is everyone else? Can you hear him? Okay. Yeah, I get some so so. So, just if you quiet. could speak um, up. I, I'll do my best to speak up. I know I'm going to be speaking a while tonight and I don't want to burn out. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, I know it's also possible to adjust volume on your end, so I'm, I'm hopefully we can keep this together. But uh, to answer the question about who is available yeah. tonight, um, Jim Lesko, the executive director of Amherst Media. We have board member Ed Severance is here. Uh, Bill Gillen, uh, the lead architect from Gillen Collaborative Architects is on the line. And uh, I'm not seeing any other names from the team on the screen. It is possible we have John Krifka, uh, as well as Attorney Michael Pill, our legal counsel, um, uh, may or may not be uh, waiting in the wings this evening. Um, I'm looking. Okay, I could not see those people, or I could not see those names in the attendees. So it's possible it, they may not be here tonight. There, there are various things happening in their lives that um, okay. I, they feel that representation is adequate. I think we have some, don't we, Pam? I see Bill Gillen and... I have moved Bill Gillen in as an attendee and Ed Severance Ed, and yeah. Jim Lesko. Those so are. it was um, Attorney Pill and John Krifka that I could not see. Okay. All right. So thank you for coming. Um, at this time, I'll just ask if um, Ms. Bestrup, Director of Planning, would like to give us an introduction or a summary, because this did come to us um, like a year ago. Yes, I just thought I would give a little bit of a history on this project. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, so I'm Chris Bestrup, Planning Director. And um, the property was formerly all one property, which included the Henry Hills House, the two front properties on which the Amherst Media Project is going to is proposed to be built, and three single-family home properties along Gray Street. That was all one big property. Um, the Henry Hills House was formerly used as the Amherst Boys Club. Some people will remember that. In 2007 and 2008, um, it was the property was subsequently purchased by two LLCs. Um, I think at least one of which was associated with Barry Roberts. And subsequently, Jerry Gadera bought the property and subdivided it into six parcels. So we have the one parcel containing the Hills House, the three along Gray Street, and the two frontage lots that we're talking about tonight. In 2013, town meeting rezoned the two frontage lots on Main Street, along with other parcels along the north side of Main Street from RG, to, uh, which is general residence, to BN, neighborhood business. This was done to create a small village center in this part of town. The pr property on the other side of Main Street had already been rezoned to business village center at around that same time. So Mr. Gadera and others moved the homes that are along Gray Street from other locations in town to create a new streetscape along the west side of Gray Street. Formerly that had been uh, lawn area and a lot of trees and brush. Um, the Henry Hills house was renovated and it's now owned by new owners and I believe it's operated as both a single family home and a bed and breakfast but they may be able to correct, create, correct that later if that's not the case. At the time of the rezoning Mr. Gadera had been discussing 
the two frontage lots with Amherst Media. So this was back in 2013, who needed uh, recognized that they needed a new home. Mr. Gadara showed town meeting a plan for the Amherst Media building, which was located at the southeast corner of the two lots, with the parking lot for the new building to be located on the western portion of the two lots. So that was shown to um, town meeting back in 2013. At the end of 2013, Amherst Media, which was then known as Amherst Community Television, purchased the property. And they've been working on developing the property as their new home since that time. In 2019, Amherst Media submitted a site plan review application for a new building that was to be located on the western portion of these two lots. And it received a lot of criticism from the planning board, from the public, and eventually from the local historic district commission. Amherst Media withdrew their site plan review application in the summer of 2019, so that was about a year ago. And then they began a lengthy conversation with the local historic district commission about a new building designed by a local architect for these two lots. So after months of public hearings with the local historic district commission, the commission issued a certificate of appropriateness for the design that you will see tonight. So I just thought that information would be helpful to you in your review. Thank you. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Sparkle, who is going to um, give us a presentation. Is there anything you'd like to share on your screen? Christine, can I just interrupt one yeah. second before Please. we begin yeah. that? Did you ask for the board disclosures? I think I did. Okay. Were there any? I'm sorry, I missed No, that. there weren't. No, there weren't. And um, so we'll have the uh, applicant's presentation and then we'll get into the site visit and stuff. Yep. Okay, thanks. Bucky, you should be all set to share your screen as a panelist. I cannot hear you at all. Really? Okay. Yep, you're muted. Or One second. Oh, I can barely hear you. You're Is really quiet. Better? Is that any better? A little better. I might be having microphone troubles here today. I apologize. Normally Zoom and my system work just great. I did uh, just move my office, so maybe I dropped my microphone. I will speak as loudly as I can. Um, and I'm sorry that tonight's the night that I'm finding out I have a microphone issue. That's okay. While you're speaking, we can all up our volumes too to better hear you. Um, okay. Uh, ho hopefully this works out. Um, can I verify? Do you do you see the screen with my logo on it? Yes. All right. Great. All right. I see what appears to be your first slide. Yes, it is. Uh, first of uh, several, I'll warn you now, uh, there's quite a bit of information to cover on this project, a lot of details that have been considered now for uh, a couple of years and have been through multiple versions of public processes. Um, so uh, we've already done a little bit of discussion regarding the application team, myself, Amherst Media. Uh, we, we have Jim Lesko here, executive director at Severance, uh, as well as their supporting, uh, supporting personnel, uh, the architect, uh, who is more than supporting is really the, the lead on this project in terms of site design and building design, uh, Gillen Collective Architects, and uh, a legal uh, counsel of Michael Pill, um, who may or may not be here this evening. Uh, it's already been stated that Amherst Media is a 501c3 um, nonprofit educational institution. It's been operating at Amherst since 1977, uh, been performing public service uh, that entire time. And this evening, and for this project, the goal is a permanent home, uh, an office supporting the educational mission and community services that it strikes a balance between the interests of the local historic area and the needs of a modern, basically technology uh, enterprise, which really is what Amherst Media is. And um, before I dive a little further into my presentation, I do want to give Jim Lesko an opportunity to chime in and unmute himself. Uh, I know he has a, a statement he'd like to present to the board before I continue. So Jim, if you're available, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and Planning Board members. Uh, Amherst Media is 
architectural and site plans to build our new media facility uh, on the Gray Street property has significantly evolved since we were last before you on March 20th of 2019. Since that time, we have secured a certificate of appropriateness from the local historic district commission, as Christine has already stated. Our journey to this point in time has been shaded publicly by those opposed to anything being built upon this parcel of land. This included the widely distributed thought that Amherst Media was offered sufficient money for our land and part of the land be turned over to the town as a park. We were to move to, into one of the schools and everyone would be satisfied. To quickly clarify, the amount offered for our land was 25% less than the property's assessed value. The town expressed concern and doubt regarding the allocation of funds to maintain the donated uh, parkland. And finally, the preliminary discussions with the school department raised some limited possibility that would require an addition to be built to attached high school. Regardless of being told in editorials that we should accept this offer if we really cared about the Amherst community, or else we should expect no financial support for our capital campaign. It is obvious Amherst Media did not agree with either part of that argument. Now we are in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic and the town's financial picture is very precarious and the schools are trying to re reorganize their classrooms and general facility space to accommodate the new state safety reopening mandate. The proposals would not have been made everyone, not have made everyone, especially Amherst Media, satisfied. We are here to offer an opportunity to the residents of Amherst to witness the construction of a new independent media center, a center propped up on the shoulders of those residents and students, staff and board members, and most importantly, viewers who for the past 44 years created, captured and watched the political, educational, cultural history of this community. It is within this building, we see the publicly called for expansion of civic dialogue and interaction for all people of the Amherst area and beyond to have the opportunity to be heard. That has always been our mission and will continue to be so. While the site plan you have tonight is not the same plan submitted by us last March, this plan does, however, reflect the advice this body gave us. The one piece of advice you gave that proved to be the most beneficial was, quote, to adhere closely to the recommendations made by the local historic district, unquote. The following points were the recommendations the LHDC made to Amherst Media and presented to you on March 20th, 2019. One, explore the possibility of placing the building on the east portion of the property. Two, considering lowering the ridge line of the building. Three, examine alternative building forms that reflect the historic setting on the north side of Main Street. And four, retain a professional registered architect suitable to design a building appropriate for the significant important property in Amherst. The planning board reiterated the LHDC recommendations, adding a desire for a 3D model, lot size verification, collaboration with town engineer to explore alternative groundwater control, and size and materials for all signage. What was vehemently stressed by both yourselves and the LHDC was the need to, and I quote, secure a professional architect who can assist in looking at the project holistically with great sensitivity to the adjacent parcels and scenic view. We followed your collective advice. The level of professionalism and cooperation displayed by Gillen Collaborative in responding to LHDC commissioners and community input regarding the building's design was of the highest order. We are equally appreciative of our site engineer, Bucky Sparkle, who overcame the numerous obstacles inherent to the property. Their expertise and high professional standards makes this submitted submittal worthy of public appreciation and support. I'd like to now introduce you to, again, our site engineer. Back to Bucky Sparkle, who will walk you through the submitted plans, plans that reflect the LHDC certificate of appropriateness. And thank you for giving me this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's formal presentation time. So uh, in terms of an outline, uh, I'll get to the formal application request. We'll do a little more background. Some of this has been covered so I can move quickly a little about the historic district commission process. And we'll talk about the site plan, architecture, content of the application. There are a couple of waivers that we are looking for regarding um, parking and traffic. And then we'll wrap it all up here tonight. Um, the formal request is that we are seeking site plan review approval under Amherst bylaw section 3.330, nonprofit educational institution. We are requesting waivers from bylaws 7.004, 0.103, 0.105, 0.110, 0.111, 0.112, 0.114, 0.115, 0.116, 0.117, 0.118, 0.119, 0.120, 0.121, 0.122, 0.123, 0.124, 0.125
11.22. I can't see it because there's stuff on my screen that has everybody's face on it. Um, you can probably read it and I can't. That's funny. Oh, wait. Uh, 11.221. I figured out my technology. And 11.2436. Uh, plus the planning board rules and regulations, Article 2, Section 3B, additional information, Item 6. Um, the last three of those have to deal with traffic studies, impact statements. The first two of those have to do with, with parking. Um, so I'll get into those details a little bit later. Uh, we talked about some of the background. I'll move quickly. Uh, the lot was created by the previous owner of what is now the Henry Hills House. Uh, the zoning was changed in 2013. Amherst Media purchased it in 2013 after the zoning change. Um, there was a comment that the previous developer, Gadara, uh, presented a plan uh, that was Amherst Media's proposal or something along those lines. I, I want to be clear that that's not true. That plan was not Amherst Media's plan. That was a concoction of that owner and developer. In fact, if you look at the little tiny text uh, on the side of that plan, it says something like SSC building. Uh, it was not for Amherst Media. And that proposal was on the Gray Street side, a three and a half story building. Um, so if people were happy with that back in the day, uh, we're proposing something much, much smaller. Um, uh, but I think that's just a minor misconception. Uh, we did apply previously 2019, and brought in Gillen Collaborative Architects, uh, who then spent uh, several meetings going through the process of redesigning the site with the Historic District Commission. And we, earlier this year, did receive a certificate of appropriateness. Um, Jim already talked about these, he's doing my job. Uh, says uh, we need to, uh, the board said, hey, get a, get a more qualified architect. Uh, we brought in Gill Gillen Collaborative, uh, who, if you're not aware, is an architect. Uh, Bill Gillen himself helped write the rules for the historic district, the rules and regulations, uh, has been involved in many historic property projects in the town of Amherst. I don't think uh, his offices are directly across the street from this um, project. He has a vested interest in maintaining a beautiful view of uh, Henry Hill's uh, property. And I don't think he could get a, a more perfect match uh, for this project on this site in this town than Gillen Collaborative. So I think it was a very lucky stroke that we were able to obtain them. Uh, we did provide some 3D modeling for the Historic District Commission. I'll show uh, some screenshots from that basically. Uh, we have adhered very closely to the Historic District Commission's recommendations. Uh, one of the strongest of which is move the building to the east, uh, which we have done. The local historic district uh, commission, uh, we had seven hearings with them between August and January uh, that had a, a major impact on the site plan. There were many versions of the building and the massing and the placement and uh, juggling all the things that a, a building needs to have. Um, and the commission said, you know, you need to do a few things um, you know, you definitely have to preserve uh, the historic viewscape. Um, so that, that was the, the primary thing. And we've done several things to change the building a little bit so that um, it fits both the residential character of the buildings on Gray Street, because this is transitional property. We have residential zoning and res residential homes uh, on one side of the lot. The other side is business and there are businesses to the east and to the south. So we wanted to have a facade that sort of reflected that and still be uh, the character of historic buildings. Um, in order to put the building on the east side, the low part of the site, we had to move the stormwater management uh, system or portion of it, just the infiltration, uh, to the uphill portion of the site. So I have made water go uphill for this project. And uh, other things that the district commission said was uh, we don't want any anything to block the view. So we can't have any tall landscape features on the west side. So we don't have any trees or similar plantings that would obfuscate the view. And the commission did write a letter of support in addition to the certificate of appropriateness. That letter was to the planning board. And I'll just quote one sentence saying, the commission approved the plans because the placement on the property makes the building consistent with the historic character of the district. You'll find wording like that multiple times in, in the letter of support. Uh, so we think we've done a really good job meeting the commission's requirements, which were heavily based upon not just the commissioner's opinions, but a great degree of public input. 
Um, briefly, uh, the lot itself, there was a question, the lot size is 24,010 square feet, according to our surveyor, so just over a half an acre. Uh, it's currently vacant, it slopes to the southeast. Uh, the parcel IDs have been stated for the record, it is zoned neighborhood business, historic district. Uh, I also want to point out, if you were to go to the master plan and look at the economic development. Mm. Growth of existing businesses, including creation of downtown business and mixed use. Bucky, uh, you're cutting in and out. Oh and no! Yeah. Hey, yeah. I have a suggestion. Uh, Jack, you have something to ask? What? What? Why? Maybe you should just call in with his phone, and just use the audio on his phone. Is that possible? And still share yeah. my screen. Yes, you, you stay where you are yeah. and add, yeah. add another. All right, login. let me use more technology here to get around mm -hmm. my technology. Um, I and think it I... sounded okay, but just it just started to start cutting up. And okay, it I does not like you're moving a wire. Yeah, so you Do have a mic issue somewhere as short in a wire. I, I guess he, he I do. Will, he will, he will need I... to mute his Zoom microphone. Yes. I, I will when do that once I successfully get us call. through. Thank you, Doug. Oh, so, we can tell right. everyone who are the Zoom experts now. <laughs> I thought I had this down. <laughs> All right, so give me a second while I guess I talk to a computer and input the ID. Um, can I just verify while I'm waiting? It says 313-626-6799. Pam, can you confirm the number I'm to dial? That number should work. Yes. Okay. It is ringing. And then she'll bring you on. You'll have to and just it, start. And you're going to say star nine. Mm -hmm. Oh, it tells me to, let me try it again. 313-626-6799. I'm somewhere between laughing and crying right now. <laughs> nope, keep breathing. It'll be fine. <laughs> And I think there's a secondary number, which is 646-876-9923. Yes. Okay, I'll try that one next, because the other one went to a message. Is it asking you would push star nine? It says no one is available to answer the call. So I'll try the 646 number. Um, six, four, six, eight, seven, six. His, his nine, voice is nine. coming through pretty well now. It's I know. Now. Okay. Well, I'll just leave that number on, on my screen. Yes. And, so uh, if uh, we'll let you know if it okay. starts to get weird again and we'll yeah, try the other please. number. I'm, and I, I do apologize. I, I have no idea why the tech is leaving uh, me down tonight. Don't worry. These, that's Murphy's law. That's what happened. Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. I have at least a Zoom meeting a week, and this is the first time I've had this problem. So, all right, I'll, I'll keep going here. Um, uh, I had been speaking a bit um, uh, about the master plan and the village center and just emphasizing that the type of development for this land is, is very much in line with what the master plan and the village center ideas are. So let's start looking at a couple of plans then. Um, this is the existing site right now. The darker green is the property. Lighter green is uh, residences around. Gray Street is to the east. Main Street is to the south. Uh, it's presently open. Uh, the original site plan showed uh, a retaining wall on the northern property at 14 Gray Street, some uh, fencing, shed, a little bit of pavement, landscaping. That was all moved about two weeks ago. So uh, this existing condition plan is a little out of date and as much as there is now even less on the property, so it's a blank slate with a couple of stumps. Uh, you can also see on this plan where we did soils testing, which isn't particularly important at this point, but it could be later. Looking at the proposed site plan, uh, the, the simplified version of it here. So the, the building in yellow and the parking area in gray you, we have a retaining wall on the northern side, and I'm going to 
zoom in a little bit just so we can see some of the detail here. I think that makes it bigger for everyone. Uh, so you can see the retaining wall that will be a fieldstone retaining wall and more of a, a Goshen stone style is designed to match the existing retaining wall that belongs to 14 Gray Street. Um, we have um, an emergency egress only on the east side, which is why it doesn't have a continued sidewalk. The main entrance from the parking lot is on the northern side of the building in this area. And then we have a pedestrian entrance for a main street uh, that will have the sort of front entrance um, through here. The parking lot is uh, effectively sunken and well hidden by the building to the south and you'll see there's landscaping and other features we can get into that um, and uh, briefly going through the dimensional regulations uh, well, we have nearly twice the lot area we need we have more than twice the frontage that we need uh, we have the setback that we need and this i'll take a pause a moment there had been a point raised that uh, Bucky, it happened again. Again? Okay. Um, is it better now? It is. Yes. Are okay. you touching a wire or something? I, I am not touching anything. I have a, a mic that sits on my desk um, and I'm not touching it. So uh, I, I'm not sure what else to tell you right now. But okay. just so keep letting me know. Don't, don't lean back and look up. Right, as long as you stay leaning forward. Is there a wire running on the floor? No. It, no, it, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish I, I wish I had better information here. <laughs> Just okay. please let me know when I go out. Um, uh, I, but the, the setback issue I think is important to bring up at this point. And that is because part of the bylaw indicates that for an educational use or a religious use, uh, that the setback would normally be doubled for most zoning uh, districts. Uh, we had uh, some confusion around this and the building commissioner, Rob Mora, wrote a letter this afternoon that clarified that section 6.6 .6 does not apply to this application um, and that the setbacks as shown are appropriate for the project. So we have what we need and um, that may come up later in the meeting, but the commissioner has determined that we're okay. You've cut out, Bucky. Okay. Um, now you're just, back in. I'm back. <laughs> here. Right. Thanks for letting me know. We'll, um, we'll just have to manage this, I guess. Um, Elbows on the table. Lean forward. <laughs> so, all right. I'll get. I'll get as close as I can here. Maybe that'll make a difference, but. Um, so building coverage, we're just over half of what's allowed. Uh, lot coverage, we're about. You know what, Bucky? You're gone oh. again. OK, let me. Try the phone number. Try yes. the other one. Let me, let me try. Sam's ready. <laughs> OK. Dialing for dollars. Could be thunder and lightning. It could be. Yeah. That's true. The weather. Well, we look okay now. He's in East Hampton. I am in Leeds. I just moved. Oh. Well, it looks clear there. Oops. Oh. Did I make it, Pam? Um, one phone call in listener, yes. Okay. Where so are I'm... you? Are you 4004? Yes. All right, I'm going to move you into the panelists. All right, and I'm going to mute my PC speaker here. Okay. Oh, I can't move him into a panelist, but I can allow him to talk. Yeah. Let's try that. Okay. okay so now, now I'm in okay. echo. But, but now you need to mute your computer. 
Basically, yeah, mute my mic. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, because I do need to hear everybody else talk, but then my phone picks up that same sound. Um, so the next question is, am I able to manipulate? So do you see the site plan now? Yes. Yes. Okay, and then dimensional. Okay, so here we go again. Um, uh, just to cut it short, we meet all the dimensional regulations. All right, M moving down the line here. Um, this is the drainage and utility plan. Uh, what we are uh, looking at is a, uh, let's see, the details. Most of the utilities run out of the north side of the building connect to Gray Street. So the sanitary is in green. We have blue for water. We are proposing a hypothetical gas service Doubt we'll ever get to use it, but we at least want it on the plan in case we have that opportunity. We have power and communications coming from the nearby utility pole over uh, the northeast corner. And then all of the orange is the stormwater management system. Uh, we have the detention tanks, these uh, 12,000 gallons of underground storage through here with the control structure that would feed a new storm manhole on Gray Street. Uh, this has been reviewed and approved by Jason Skeels. And we have on the west side the infiltration system, which is all of this area through here. Uh, it involves a collection tank. We collect the roof water. We put it in the settling tank. We have a recharge volume and a pump. And that's how we get it uphill. And in this orange shaded area is a pressure distribution system that will then disperse the storm water over a three day period at a rate of roughly five one hundredths of an inch per hour. Um, so that's how we get the water back into the ground in a very slow drip fashion. Um, also, we do have site lights proposed um, and we have a lighting plan later, but we have two um, poles, one on the west side, one on the east side. The height of those uh, light fixtures is 10 feet. We also have a bollard uh, over on the east side to make sure that these parking spaces are reasonably illuminated and under each doorway. Oh, we also have a building mounted light, um, uh, a wall light here that illuminates this arcing section of the uh, parking lot. Um, and above each door, there's a light. I'll talk a little more about lighting later. I'm going to back out. So uh, this is the architect's elevation drawing with uh, approximate colors that they put together for the presentation and seeing what would the building look like when you're not a bird. And um, we did receive unanimous approval from the Historic District Commission in terms of the certificate of appropriateness for this building. This is the Main Street side. This is the businessy side of the building. It's a broad structure. It's about 105 feet wide. Um, and it has a relatively um, a modest roof line considering there's a television studio underneath it. Uh, it's a 26 foot high to the peak from the finished floor level. And uh, it has a nice entrance area, a lot of glass fenestration and a series of other windows. Um, it also, we do have a sign, a pin mounted sign uh, over the main door and over on the edge of the, the building on that side toward Gray Street. Um, it's a Greek revival style and it definitely blends the residential and commercial character of the neighborhood. Uh, going back in time just a little bit, uh, hopefully I won't give anybody uh, tremors here. This was what we were originally proposing, uh, came from a different designer who was not uh, an architect familiar with historic district principles. Uh, it met Amherst Media's uh, internal needs very well, but uh, we, we definitely understand why the community did thought that maybe this wasn't the most appropriate building. Um, so the outline of the new building has been transposed in that orangish color, and you can see that it's, it's a lower structure, uh, it's a, a more elegant structure in almost every regard. Um, if we do want to get into details of the architecture and elevations, I'm, I'm happy to do so. The only one I really want to point out at this point is the Gray Street view and vista. So this is uh, the east end of the building along Gray Street. And 
this structure has is the part that is to blend much more with the residential feel of Grave Street. Uh, so the peak of the roof, while it is 26 feet high, it is also um, not, it is lower than the building just up the street. Um, and uh, the width of the building is about 55 feet, which is less than the width of some of the buildings abutting it. So in terms of scale and mass, it is a more diminutive structure and has a much more residential feel. The entrance is more like a, an old time you know, classic New England front porch entrance. Uh, even though this is not uh, actually an entrance, I will say this is just an emergency exit, but from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, it's a residential look and feel. Um, looking a uh, little bit on the inside, I might have to drag this. Um, just to give a sense that there there is a television studio and a control room and another small studio. So that takes up a good third of the inside of the building. There are several offices uh, for various tasks. Uh, we have a conference room, break room, you know, it's, it's a business lobby and entrance, as well as a computer center. Um, that And this is part of the educational aspect of this um, business here. Um, and looking at some of the views. This is part of the 3D modeling uh, that we we're able to provide to the local historic district commission. And uh, there, there could be a lot of information that we can go through. Uh, so I'm gonna try and minimize where I, where I bring attention. So I'm gonna look at the bird's eye view for a moment. And <clears throat> so uh, Main Street and Gray Street are here. This is the property in the slight pink coloration and this is the dimensional model of the building itself relative to all of the other buildings. So all of these buildings are to scale and were developed by a UMass architecture student on our behalf and to give a sense of where things are relative to everything else. Um, you can see that the building height just to the east are fairly significant and quite in line with is being proposed on Gray Street. Uh, the building across the street at 401 Main Street is actually a story to maybe a story and a half taller than this building. So the large, when you're coming down, up and down Main Street, you'll notice that 401 Main Street will be the, the largest, bulkiest, tallest structure. Uh, in the rear here, we have the Amherst Women's Club and the Henry Hills House at 38 Gray Street. Um, and from this aerial, I want to point out that if uh, what, there's a talk about viewscape. So we, th the old building was way over here on the west side. It was located relatively in front of the Henry Hills building. So we've moved it to the east uh, as far as we can place it. And the setbacks have been fine tuned by the Historic District Commission. They wanted to match Main Street and Gray Street and what was in the neighborhood. So that's what we've got. And as far as taking, if you were to be walking or driving up Main Street, um, the objects that prevent a clear view of what was, this was all once open lawn. Um, we now have, you know, beautiful homes here and trees. So it is impossible to see the Henry Hills building until you are roughly here. If you were driving westward or walking westward, you wouldn't be able to see that building until you got pretty much to the end of the proposed Amherst Media building. So the, the building as we're showing it is making very little impact on the viewscape and uh, the primary open and dead on view of that uh, gorgeous architectural feature uh, is fully unobstructed by our proposal. Um, and if we wanna get into some of the other details of what you can see from where, we certainly can. Um, but I do want to keep moving this presentation along. Uh, looking a little bit at the landscaping, zoom in a bit again. What we are proposing um, are a couple of larger trees on the east side. We have a disease resistant elm, uh, a white oak tree, uh, various perennials and shrubbery around the building. Um, and the smaller trees here are more diminutive like uh, there's a magnolia, there's a weeping katsura, and a service berry that will provide uh, a lot of color and uh, as well as some uh, 
um, food for wildlife. And importantly, on the west side, we have a bank of, they look like boxwoods. That's what is stuck in my head. Uh, <laughs> and, oh, what did I do there? Sorry. Um, trying to get the name of that particular tree is, it's called a Steed's Japanese Holly. Uh, it is a broadleaf evergreen tree. If you know what a boxwood looks like, um, that's, it's very similar. It looks nothing like an arborvitae, and we're, we're glad that's the case. Arborvitaes are not, um, they're, they're not my favorite and definitely not the architect's favorite. This was a landscape plan. It does have my title block, but the landscape layout was designed by hand by uh, Taylor Davis Landscaping. So they're really the brain trust behind this. I can answer rudimentary questions on it, um, but I'd have to go back to the landscaper if we get into you know, what one species needs versus another. Uh, I was just the drafts person on this particular plan. Moving on to the lighting plan, uh, we I talked briefly about it. First, I'll zoom back into the uh, site itself. We do have a photometric plan of foot candles. That's what all the chaotic numbers and crosses are all over the paved areas. Um, so we we had a lot of conversation with the light designer here, who is, by the way, um, Oh, now the name is escaping me, but it's the same light designer that has designed virtually every light that the town of Amherst has installed in the last decade. Uh, all the downtown lights, the historic lights, they're very familiar with Amherst and the preferences of the municipality as well as uh, many projects in town. Um, so they're, they were a really good source for this particular project. Um, and we're trying to balance uh, you know, in historic areas, usually there isn't a lot of bright light. So we were really trying to minimize and get down to just what was needed to provide safety um, and make sure that we're not, you know, crossing lot lines with any illumination. Um, so we've been pretty successful in that. We have uh, just a little bit of light on the sidewalk, which will help if there are pedestrians when vehicles are coming and going. Uh, we've got a nice gradient and this green area is sort of the sweet spot of light attenuation. Uh, we have on the northern neighbor, which is was of utmost concern of ours being a resident, uh, the vast majority of these points are 0.0. .0. There is an odd anomaly, and we talked to the guy about the model, that even though we have zeros here, 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 Somehow past it, we have a couple of point ones, point one. And I, I do want to point that out because uh, the light designer says that the software itself will, um, I mean, it's not a glitch, but its margin of error is 0 0.1 foot candles. Uh, so it's his opinion that since there are zeros in front and zeros all around it, that that's just sort of <clears throat> um, statistical warbling in the software. Um, and I do want to point out that that this is there's a trench drain here, and this part of that property is a relatively steep slope. It's not a place where people are hanging out. There's uh, quite a bit of plantings and vegetation through here. So even if somehow the software was right and it went from dark to light again, from zero to zero point one, uh, there are plantings that really the light would never get there anyway, and it's nowhere near the building. Uh, so that was a lot to say that. I think we're good at the lot lines. Uh, there are uh, three lights that we do want to keep on for safety around the clock at night. And those are the three lights over the doors. All the lights in the parking lot will be on photometric sensors and timers, and they're designed to turn off at 9.30 p.m. Emerus Media closes at six, but you know, sometimes people stay over late at work. So we wanted to make sure that um, people were able to get in and out safely and have a dark parking lot uh, at a reasonable hour adjacent to a um, residential neighborhood. So even all of these values out here and in the street, uh, they would all blank out at zero at 9.30 p.m. Uh, and take a moment to look at the signs a little bit. Need to back up here. So um, the, the way the information was presented to me, it comes in two sorts. So we have what are pin mounted signs. And I pointed these out on the facade of the building above the door and uh, on the east side, uh, several feet off the ground. 
these are um, attached to the building with pins. They're only four inch high letters, so they're fairly diminutive and just adequate to be able to read from the street, um, but definitely not distance. Uh, a more ornamental sign is proposed on the site. Oh, I should point out where that is. So let me go back to here. So uh, on the north side of the driveway entrance is the ornamental sign. So this would be a sign that would have a stone facade such that it will reflect the stone walls along the back of the retaining wall and the neighbor's stone wall. So going back to that image, you can see the hand-drawn sketches here from the architect where uh, it's, it's you know, an elegant and fairly stately sign with uh, the Amherst Media logo and a stone facade that would match the Goshen stone. Uh, at the top, it has a, a slate cap. If you look in the cross section, it has a two foot wide slate cap, a little hood for a LED light that would just, uh, just light the face of the sign. It's shielded on three sides. So you would have to be directly under the sign to uh, get any light bleed off from that. Um, the ends, it, it's gonna be on the ends in the north side uh, all look like that stone wall that um, is pre-existing and we are going to match. Uh, looking um, into getting away from some of the visuals and getting into the application content, um, we, we do have to talk about a management plan. So quickly, uh, there isn't gonna be a dumpster on this site. It's just gonna be barrels that are hauled off to the side when it's time for pickup. Uh, professionals are going to handle landscape and snow. Uh, the operating hours are, I think, 10 a.m. that I mentioned that are 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And that's important to remember when we get into the traffic and school, uh, school scenario discussion. As far as employees, there are three full-time employees plus interns of a varying number. Um, and they're in a usually a part-time state. Um, as far as sound and storage and deliveries, they're very minimal. And similarly, noise, dust, odor, and building maintenance are also minimal. Um, all right, so a little bit into the, I said I'd talk more about parking. So this is, this is part of it. So we, the facility has been around, I, I wrote down 45 years. I, I realize it's only 44 years, uh, so I do have an error in my presentation. I apologize. Uh, but for 44 years, Amherst Media has been operating there, well aware of what their parking needs are. That this is not um, a new building, a new office, uh, a new shopping center where people are making a guess about what they're going to need. Uh, their needs are very well understood. Uh, there are just three staff um, and a couple of interns, a couple of short term visitors that come and go for brief periods of time. Uh, after reviewing their use and photos from the blessing of satellites or curse there of satellites, uh, the, I've never seen more than four cars in the parking lot. The Amherst Media says that they rarely, rarely get over five vehicles in the parking lot. And when I look at various photos, uh, historic data, the average number of cars in the parking lot is 2.5. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we feel that our waiver request to have fewer parking spaces because we are requesting eight parking spaces versus what the bylaw would normally require for an office, which is 15 parking spaces. So it's a, it's a big difference. However, we know we don't have more than five cars at a time on this property. And uh, we also are very concerned about the site layout and the aesthetics. We can hide an eight car parking lot behind the building and at the bottom of a four foot slope and, and add a little bit of, of shrubbery to the west side. And those cars are going to uh, virtually vanish from the main street and the triangle street perspectives. You will of course be able to see into the parking lot from the driveway entrance on Gray Street, uh, but that is uh, not a well-traveled um, not a well-traveled street, um, except unless you're a student. Uh, we can get into that a bit more. And another reason that there are so few cars in a building of this size, four and a half thousand square feet, 
is that many of the users of this building are, are students or interns and they walk from school, they ride their bikes, they take the bus and the bus stop uh, PBTA is at, at the corner of Green and Gray and Main Street. So it is right there. And that's one of the reasons, one of the several reasons that Amherst Media is interested in this site particularly is that it provides excellent public access through bus routes. It provides excellent proximity to the high school, to the middle school, uh, to Amherst College, and uh, a short bus ride from UMass. And these are many, many of the visitors to this facility. So the location uh, on Main Street is, is excellent and also significantly reduces the parking requirement for, for Amherst Media. Um, and I do wanna point out, I know off or on street parking is is sacrosanct. You know, you, you can't use it and we're not planning on using it. But I do want to talk about the fact that it exists. And there are 25 almost completely vacant parking spaces 24 seven on Gray Street that are on the same block. You don't have to cross the street to go between Amherst Media and a vast quantity of potentially overflow parking. We have eight parking spaces. We rarely need more than five. On average, we need two and a half, but in the very, very statistically unusual occurrence where we would have a full parking lot, then there is safe and convenient parking that is almost never occupied adjacent to this building. Um, and I also wanna point out that residential use of, of street parking you know, for a party or birthdays, these are, evenings and these are weekends where all of a sudden you get a big surge of parking for several hours. Uh, those residential use peak times are not when this commercial business would be operating. You know, Monday through Friday, 10 to 6, is usually not when somebody has a big party. Uh, so in the extra rare occasion where Amherst Media would need extra parking and residents of Gray Street would need extra parking, these two things are, are not going to occur at the same time. Uh, by any reasonable probability. So it's sort of the, the fallback position. I know we can't use it officially, uh, but I just want to point out that it is available and it is substantially underutilized. I know I sent a letter to the town uh, which showed several satellite photos and um, there were usually zero cars parked there, sometimes two cars parked there. Um, so there's quite a bit of availability. All right, this dovetails a little bit with the traffic impact statement, um, as well as waiver requests. Three of the five waiver requests are about uh, traffic studies impact statements. Uh, we're, we're talking about an office uh, with about three full-time staff here uh, that would be driving. Um, we're not, this is not a retail establishment or a church or a restaurant. Uh, facilities that generate up to 20 times more traffic per square foot than a, a business. And what we're really talking about is a use that's gonna generate about as much traffic as one and a half residences. So if you were to talk about, you know, adding one or two homes to Gray Street, it would be extremely surprising for somebody to say, oh, we, we should do a traffic impact study and see what impact one or two homes will have on Gray Street um, because it's pretty common sense that it would have virtually no impact. Um, and I do want to point out that, and this is very important, that it is understood that there is sometimes quite chaotic traffic on Gray Street with buses and young drivers, um, people coming and going to the schools up Gray Street. That traffic is real and it happens, but it does not happen when Amherst Media would be generating traffic. These events occur at different times of the day. Amherst Media opens at 10 a.m. School's already in session by then. School is let out and traffic is gone by 6 p.m. when Amherst Media closes. And the three staff that work there would not be traveling at the hours that the understandable chaos that the schools generate occurs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, other than the schools, uh, Gray Street is a, is a very low volume dead end road. I think when uh, roughly dead, I know there's cross street um, but it doesn't feed a larger neighborhood beyond. Um, during the site walk yesterday, I did point out that um, I personally didn't notice one single car during the time we all met on site. 
and maybe people notice other things, but when it's not school, it's a very, very quiet street. Um, additionally, uh, Amherst Media's driveway is only 83 feet from Main Street. It will be the first driveway. So visitors to Amherst Media are gonna be coming from Main Street uh, almost exclusively just because that's the, the nature of, of traffic in that part of town. So the vehicles that would be traveling to Amherst Media would not go in front of a, a single other driveway. They don't drive down anybody's in front of anybody's house. Uh, so the impact on Gray Street is, is very, very small. Um, I did mention that many of the visitors, they don't drive, they take the bus, they bike, they walk. And um, it's, I would say, a bit of a hardship to have the uh, traffic impact study done to demonstrate uh, what I think logically and common sense I'm demonstrating now that there's very little traffic uh, being generated by Amherst Media um, for this situation. Um, moving on to comments, we received two letters uh, from Berkshire Design Group, BDG. Uh, this is an engineering company I have a lot of respect for. And in this particular case, they have been hired in by one of the neighbors um, that has a uh, the financial ability to bring in uh, legal counsel and uh, another engineering firm to do their best to make this look as bad as possible. Uh, and, and that's their, their right to do. Um, but the letter that we received first was about stormwater. It had 13 points in it. I did re respond and provided a letter to the board as well as that other engineer. Uh, the town engineer got it. Uh, Jason Skeels had zero comments relative to the Berkshire Design Group comments. Um, he had a, a few very minor points, uh, the largest of which was that he would like to see a belt and suspenders approach to make darn well sure that there's no possibility of ice ever coming over the sidewalk. Uh, so he would like us to add a, a bit of a a cutoff drain, a curtain drain uh, on part of the property just uphill the sidewalk, which uh, we're, we're going to add to um, the plan, just as, as Jason recommended. Um, Berkshire Design Group also provided a letter with 17 points regarding the site plan, um, the vast majority of which were very minor, and I, and I talked about those in a letter, and I'm happy to go into them, but I'm doing a lot of talking here. Uh, if you have questions, we'll do that. Uh, there was one point. Uh, which I already touched upon that Berkshire Design Group brought up, and that was Section 6.6 .6 of the Zoning Bylaw. And this is when my mic was cutting out, so maybe I didn't make my point, but 6.6 um, .6 would say that an educational use or a religious use would have to have a double setback requirement. Uh, if you were to have a, a large church or a research facility or a dorm, this makes an awful lot of sense. The building is proposed, while it does function and is, you know, charted to be an educational uh, facility, it, its use is really an office and it is a very small building relative to, to a church or university building. So doubling the setbacks doesn't make sense. But more importantly, uh, and this is a quote from the building commissioner who released a letter this afternoon, he says that section 6.6 .6 of the zoning bylaw does not apply and the additional setback is not required. Uh, so that's why I'm confident that the site as designed does meet all of the dimensional requirements of the town. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, necessarily have to talk about waivers a little bit here. Uh, I'll try and move through this quickly. Bylaw 7.004 talks about parking spaces and how many spaces. Uh, the, the gist of it is uh, we are we're looking for eight instead of 15. Uh, and bylaw 7.90 allows waivers uh, by the board for safety, aesthetic, and site design reasons. We have very strong aesthetic and site design reasons in this particular case being in the historic district. Uh, primarily to preserve the viewscape, this is a critical motivation for the plan and, and virtually every aspect of it. The viewscape, of course, to the Amherst Women's Club which is mostly uh, obscured by its own vegetation, which is gorgeous, but you can't see the building very well, but really the Henry Hills house, uh, we, we, want, we don't wanna put a parking lot in front of that, or we don't wanna force the building to the west just to have 15 parking spaces when we only use two and a half parking spaces on average. Um, so 
Um, additionally, the Historic District Commission had stipulations that we did want to hide the cars. We did want to preserve the lawn. And even though that lawn on the west of the property is not, no longer belongs to 38 Gray Street, Henry Hills, uh, it does still feel like it is contiguous and historically it was contiguous with that property. So we are able to preserve that continuity and historic significance by having a small parking lot. Uh, and it does also minimize the impact on the neighborhood. Uh, the parking lot does meet all the design standards, meets or exceeds them. Um, and the spaces of the eight proposed spaces also exceeds the building needs. We have 44 years of parking and the average, we have two and a half cars there and almost never more than five cars. So eight spaces um, are, even that's going to be more than necessary almost every single day, uh, every hour of every day. So uh, we have confidence that the parking lot as proposed is more than adequate. Bylaw 7.103, um, this talks about, you, know, you can't normally by the bylaw park a car within eight feet of the building or drive a car within five feet of the building. And in a pre-submittal meeting with Mike Roy, the fire safety officer, fire safety officer uh, I think is his title at the fire department, um, he indicated that that rule is because there's concern about if a car catches fire, we do not want to ignite the building that it's next to. This is, makes an awful lot of sense. But he also said that, well, you can use fire retardant materials in the construction where you are less than eight feet from a parking space, where we are less than five feet from a parking space, and that takes care of the concern. So, um, or at least this is what we're proposing, where we are using uh, intumescent paint and or fire engineered materials uh, within those areas of the construction just to ensure the, the protection of the building itself that is definitely in Amherst Media's interest as well. Going down the list, all of these bylaw 11.221.2436 and the planning board rule and regulation um, dot, 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 uh, item six talk about traffic study, traffic reports, traffic statements. Uh, and I've already spoken about this a fair amount. Uh, we are generating 12 to perhaps 20 trips per day. That is about the same as one and a half residences. Uh, peak hours only gonna see two or three trips if you look at the, the numbers of it. Um, the access is off a of low volume road, off of Gray Street, you know, so long as it's not during school hours, which we are not. And um, there's a, the users of the building, unlike a lot of offices, uh, do use public transit and walk and bike quite regularly. So it diminishes the, the traffic trip generation. Look, this one says wrap up. So um, I do want to mention that, you know, the project does address all the bylaw requirements. Uh, we have followed the board's recommendations from 2019. We do have the support of the local historic district commission, uh, not just with the certificate of appropriateness, but with in, in an additional letter of support. Uh, and we have made significant improvements to the building and to the site uh, from its original, our original submittal more than a year ago uh, and substantially diminished the neighborhood impact. And I would like to close with kind of a hypothetical, a, a what if. I really believe that this project is going to succeed in the permitting process, but I do want to um, provide information to a small degree to the planning board, but in a larger sense to uh, the general public and the reality of what we're looking at, two viable buildable lots on Main Street. These are prime real estate in the historic district. And if Amherst Media is not successful, then what happens next? What if they're not successful and the project is denied? So the land is going to be sold. That is the logical next step. Uh, and because if Amherst Media's project after going through the process it has is not approvable, then really no local small business is going to be willing to step in and pick this up. So if in this business district somebody wants to buy the two lots that are there and use them as a single developable lot, uh, it's in all likelihood going to be some corporate entity. So they're going to have non-local interests. They're going to have deep pockets and they're going to already know the history of these meetings and be ready to um, propose something that they think is going to work. And they're going to have the, 
uh, wherewithal to to work that through the permitting process, uh, assuming they meet the regulations and appropriateness. So everybody has to do that. Um, but what's really more likely is that it won't be sold to a business. It, it will be left as two lots and sold as two single family residences in the historic district. And in that case, um, many of the, the dissenting perspectives that I've heard about this project, um, are the, the concerns are made much worse uh, with two single family homes going up here for several reasons. One, you know, from a technical standpoint, uh, single family homes do not have to manage their stormwater. So there's going to be increased runoff from the site. Uh, the icy sidewalk condition will in all likelihood continue. Um, and the, the mitigation that is being offered by this commercial development is, is gonna vanish. That um, one of these lots only has frontage on Main Street in the turning lane. So for them to get in and out of the, their house, they're gonna have to go through uh, a relatively dicky, uh, tricky uh, intersection, well, not intersection, but the uh, a lane widening. It's it'll be a, a dicey little area to be getting in and out of from a residential driveway, but is absolutely permissible by the bylaw. Uh, and putting, you know, the, the homes that would go up on these sites, they're they're not going to be small little capes, not not with the prime real estate in a historic district. They're going to be commensurate with the large and beautiful homes on Gray Street. So you will see a two-story home with an attic probably on each of these properties, one of which is smack dab in front of the Henry Hills house. So uh, that viewscape is going to vanish. They're going to have trees eventually. And uh, much of what people are fighting for to preserve this view uh, is, is going to be utterly lost when somebody comes and builds a house there. Because the house doesn't go in front of the planning board. It goes in front of the Historic District Commission but you just have to provide appropriateness. It's very, very hard for any municipality, as I know the board knows, to say, well, you can't build here because we just don't want anything there. If it's a buildable lot and the proposal meets the bylaw requirements, um, the, the building is, is virtually guaranteed. It has to be appropriate, but it's almost certain to go forward as two single family homes if, if a project like Amherst Media doesn't go forward. And Amherst Media is locally oriented, and it's been a community service for many years. They're gonna manage their stormwater. They're gonna manage the stormwater coming at them from uphill from the Amherst Women's Club and from the Henry Hills House. And this project pushed down to the east and low side of the site is going to really preserve the view of the Henry Hills building. Um, so these are things that I want the board to keep in mind and really the public to keep in mind that uh, from my perspective that the Amherst Media proposal is just about the best thing that could possibly be put on this property. I know many people say nothing should go there. If you owned a bunch of property and had somebody tell you you can't build on it, that's that's a bit of a problem to say. Property owner rights are, are real and this has been slated for development for a number of years. So this this is what we're doing. We're trying to meet the community needs and, and move forward with this village district and uh, uh, ideas for the town. So with that, thank you for your time um, and dealing with the technical difficulties I've been managing here. And I turn it over now to the board for questions, comments. We'll go back and forth a little bit. I'll turn my volume up and hopefully if you get echoey, let me know. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sparkle. Well, that was all very informative and to be expected a lot of information. Um, we'll give you a break for a minute. Um, uh, now might be a good time for us to do our site visit report um, and then we'll do questions um, from the board. Uh, Jack Jemsek, I think, volunteered to do the site visit report. Are you, can you do that, Jack? Yes. Um, so, yeah, a group of us met there. I think everybody, uh, except Doug and Maria. Um, and they had outlined the footprint of the building with a uh, string and had a survey tripod set up with the, with the actually uh, the survey uh, stick ruler, whatever, that, so we get an idea of not only the horizontal layout of the structure, but as well uh, as the height of, uh, uh, of the, the crust of the, of the roof line. Uh, on 
different ends of the building too as well. So that it was, uh, it was a very good site visit in terms of seeing what had happened. We observed that the drainage coming from the Henry Hills house was uh, converted into an underground drain that connects to the, to, uh, the sewer on Gray Street. Uh, so we saw you know, like a disturbed area uh, as a result of that, that obviously looked like it probably remedied uh, quite a bit with regard to the stormwater uh, or the surface water runoff that was coming off the uphill property. We observed uh, the new uh, retaining wall on the abutting house uh, uh, to the north uh, on Gray Street. Um, and, and then uh, what else did we talk about? Anyway, just, you know, just general background. Yeah, I think that's, that was basically it. Um, Chris, do you have anything else to add in regard to questions that were asked or anything? And will a report eventually be generated from that? Um, I can write a report if you would like me to. That would probably be a good idea. I took a lot of notes during the site visit. Um, one thing that we did note was that um, what Mr. Sparkle said with regard to the view of the Henry Hills house, um, there are some birch trees that um, currently block the view of the Hills house until you get past the birch trees when you're coming from the east. So um, the, we observed that the west end of the building is going to be roughly where those birch trees are. So you have to, to get past the building and you'd be able to see um, the Hills house immediately past the new building if it does get built. Um, we talked about um, the fact that the western portion of the lot would be um, relatively uh, the same as it is now. I think it's going to be raised 10 inches and graded um, to meet the surrounding grade. So we, we sort of um, noted where that was going to be. And we talked about um, what the entrance, where the entrance drive would be um, over towards the east. And we also talked about the fact that the town, um, when it was constructing the turning lane onto Triangle Street, encroached onto um, the Samhurst Media property and that the town is going to um, obtain an easement from Amherst Media because of that encroachment. I think that's it. Great. Um, yeah, the only other thing I want to add is it's great having this slide up right now that when we stood to the west of where the building is proposed, that you can see the building is actually sunk a little bit into the hill. You can kind of see that there. Um, and as Jack was referencing, we actually had like a ruler showing the end of that building will be about 18 or 19 feet up. And um, Chris talked about adding they're going to grade a little bit more right to that to the left there on the west side. I think uh, Mr. Sparkle had said it was like 10 inches of dirt or something that would be spread over that area and raise it a little bit, which will only hide this building even more. Um, and I think the peak, the center part you can see there, I think that was 26 feet. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Sparkle or someone. Um, I think that height was 26, which is equal or less than um, the next building that is to the north of it, the residential house. So that was a lot. Thanks, Jack. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up to questions for, from the board, um, but I just want to clarify one thing. We will be, this hearing will be continued to our next planning board meeting, uh, which I believe, I think is the 15th. Yeah for two weeks from now, the 15th. So we got a tremendous amount of documentation with this project that we've been all reading and going through. And we will have time later to get into the weeds of different letters and reports that we have. Um, tonight, I would like to focus board questions on the presentation that happened and questions that can be um, given to Mr. Sparkle or the architect, Mr. Gillen. Um, or even uh, Amherst Media itself, their representative. So at this time, I see one hand. Um, and 
when I don't see any more hands in a bit, if we um, don't have more questions for tonight, then I will open it up for public comment. And um, so I see Doug and then I have Jack. I don't actually have a question <laughs> for anyone, but I did wanna take the opportunity at the start of this deliberation to state what I understand to be our role in this process. And that is uh, contrary to what a number of neighbors and maybe other people in the community uh, think, we are not in the position of prohibiting or stopping this project. Uh, the owner of this property has the right to build on the property. And we are here to review and help optimize the site plan for uh, in, in consideration of the surrounding neighborhood. So, you know, people don't like it. Uh, you know, this has come, been, been a, a, a project that's been coming for a number of years. And uh, unless the town or somebody else wants to buy the property and uh, that something's gonna be built here. That's all Thank I you. want. Thank you, Doug. Uh, just so to remind everyone, that is what we're addressing tonight. We're addressing a, a site plan review and not a special permit. Um, so, uh, it, Jack, you're next, and then I, uh, Michael's next. Um, yes, I, I was just looking at a PDF and uh, I lost it. Um, but well, anyway, I, I thought that the presentation was excellent. Uh, very thorough uh this design uh, just i don't want to say it's flawless but it, it is so much improved and uh and uh quite impressive and i know the storm water was something you had to solve so i'm glad that you you figured something out uh in that regard and and i guess i had okay here i have the diagram it's your uh, grading drainage and utilities plan sheet 414 and um, you know I it, it appears that you addressed the comments by uh, Berkshire uh, design group which is fine and then you know the city engineer or town engineer did not have uh, any comments subsequent uh, to that um, and I just I guess I'm just curious about the stormwater the the water that's going up into the field is that all just uh water from the roof only all right i think i'm back online you are we can hear you thank you um so the roof water the vast majority of that water is being collected um i think i'm getting an echo hang on let me there is a little echo i'll, I'll turn you down here um, turn me down. That's so odd. Uh, <laughs> most of the roof water is being collected and through gutters and brought in. Uh, there's a little pipe back here. Let me zoom in a bit. Um, uh, a pipe back here that collects water from the roof and a pipe through here that collects water from the roof, a gutter system. Um, and uh, that, that water is considered clean as it, it doesn't have any runoff from the earth. It's not a metal roof. Uh, we are also, there's a catch basin down here, so in addition to the roof area, um, which is, I should say that there is a, a minimum of 65% of the impervious area that's being created, that we capture that and infiltrate that on an average annual basis. The roof area is not sufficient to achieve 65%. However, uh, if you were to look at the property, so you can see that there's a slope you know, these contours that run this way, we have a slope coming at us from uh, the Amherst Women's Club and 38 Gray Street that brings in two and a half acres of water into our system that flows over the ground. And we're a half acre site. So we are collecting two and a half acres of runoff and through this catch basin. And then we are more than meeting our recharge requirement. In fact, we are going to be putting a, a, a huge volume of water back into the earth uh, far more than is necessary just because we're going to be collecting it. Um, and in times where overflows, which will occasionally happen, um, the overflow will go through the pipe system, through our detention system, be detained in most circumstances, and then go to the 
town's storm drain. I'll point out that right now there's a catch basin uh, on the street here and catch basins on the street here that are collecting the runoff from uh, all of the, the what is now grass area. Uh, so it goes directly to the town's drain system in its current condition, including over the sidewalk, uh, which is part of that icy condition. So we're, we're grabbing that water, we're putting it through a settling tank, we're grabbing a volume of it, we're pumping it into this, um, it's not really a drain field, um, it's, it's an irrigation system in some ways. It's a very specialized tubing with small emitters. Um, but we're going to be recharging with roof water as well as the currently unmitigated runoff from the 38 Main and the Amherst Women's Club. Great. Well, well thank you. Uh, it looks like a very smart design. I'm glad you were able to engineer something where you're able to move the building to the east and make use of the uh, the freeboard above the water table over there on the on the west side for the infiltration that you needed to have. So nice job. I grew as an engineer on this per particular design. So uh, <laughs> it was good. Thank you for the compliment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next is Michael, and then Maria. Thank you. I echo every what everyone's been saying. Uh, particularly uh, Doug's point that uh, we are here to improve the project if we can and not to uh, to block it. I, I, I would, I recall when I first moved to town and when I lived in the Dickinson house for not 10 years, uh, that the Hills House and the Women's Club both had huge lawns in front of them and there were no buildings on the side of Gray Street up to the Women's Club, up, up to where the Boys and Girls Club was at that point. And that was a beautiful landscape. Um, and I wish that were still a beautiful landscape. Uh, and it is not. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Gillum and Mr. Sparkle have put together an excellent solution to uh, the need for and the ined inevitability of a building on this site. Uh, much as I would hate, much as I hate to see a building on this site, uh, nonetheless, there's going to be one, and this is going to be a good one, I think. I do have one question relative to the studio usage and its relationship to the amount of parking that's provided. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of studio production uh, activities are planned. Uh, I do know that uh, when you have studio production, you have a certain number of technical personnel involved and a certain number of on-camera people. Uh, I can't imagine many fewer than five or six people uh, involved in any kind of even modestly complex program. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, someone from Amherst Media speak to uh, what their production schedule is in the building and how many people that generates and what kind of uh, uh, building usage it, it involves other than the three people who are staff people who work there on a regular basis. Jim, I hope you can address that question. Uh, I think I'll try. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question is kind of making me almost smile and it hurts is that during the pandemic, our studio is sitting there pretty much empty at the moment. Uh, but when we were up previous to the pandemic, uh, you usually have a host and two guests at the most uh, with sometimes one uh, camera person and one person to two people in our control room. So with three staff members taking that, you're looking at just a minimum of three people coming in for a half an hour or an hour. Uh, we don't do big productions in the sense of like uh, plays or things like that. So it's a very small number of a few number of people, but also for a short period of time. I hope, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, um, I recognize Maria. Um, thank you, Bucky, for that uh, marathon presentation. That was really great. Oh. <laughs> um, I have to say, this is exactly what this site needed. It needed a really careful look by professionals 
to really examine what this site needed for this amenity of Amherst Media. And um, I just want to thank both Amherst Media and the design team, engineering team, for their dedication to carefully examining this and responding to multiple boards and members of the public. Um, I, I mean, Jack wasn't too far off when he said this is just you know, this is perfect, it's flawless. I, I really think this is just what the site needed. It needed to hide the parking, but provide just enough so that the site could be preserved, the views could be preserved. The architecture matches the, the context really nicely. And um, and yeah, I just wanna thank the, the whole team and, and the, the staff at Town Hall for their dedication as well to really make this project um, come together because it's such an amenity. We really need Amherst Media, like all the public has been saying, and um, we just really need a good building for this site. And um, I, I, I think it's the most appropriate thing they can do with the spaces they have and the topography. Um, I, and you know, as far as the neighbors' concerns, um, I think like on another project we were saying, you know these are members of the community. They're going to be good neighbors. They're going to respond to when something comes up. They're not going to just, you know, put on blinders. So um, I, I'm sure Amherst Media is the same way. And so um, anything to do with traffic or noise or lights, you know, those things will be worked out. They're not going to turn a blind eye. But, um, but I just want to really thank everyone's hard work over the last year on this um, this design and engineering. It's just, um, it's just what the site did. I, I, really i think the only thing i had was um you know you said you had no dumpsters so you just have those rolling bins just think about where they might be located because you know if one's garbage it might be smelly so it might still be outside somewhere but um but really i i honestly it just um i don't really see any issues at all and um it's already been so thoroughly vetted by so many boards and people that um I feel like uh, we just need a few key inf bits of information about some stormwater or some sort of code related issues. But honestly, I think as far as the um, overall design, um, I, I just really appreciate all the hard work that's gone behind it. And it turned out great. Great. Um, so I'm not seeing any other hands at this time and I'm gonna move to public comment. Um, and I just want to reiterate that I agree with what my other fellow board members are saying. Uh, this is a well thought out, well detailed, well engineered. Um, just so many aspects have been um, entered into this design. And I thank Amherst Media for being flexible. And this is a very modest design. Um, and they've really tried to, I think, get away with as little as they can to not have an overly large building and uh, looking at the waivers that are being requested, you know, they're, they're not gonna have an impact on the traffic. Um, there's no need for that in my mind. Um, you know, there's eight parking spots and they've really detailed the, how the hours of operation, um, and if there are existing traffic issues in the area, this uh, facility will not be making it worse. So, um, and the parking spaces, uh, I always feel don't build more parking than you need. So I think they've adequately addressed their needs. And like they said, it, it's not the full answer, but there's a whole street of parking over 20, 25 spots that are out there that are needed, you know, if they are needed for an hour or two. Um, and that's what they're there for. So, um, I still see no other hands, so I'm gonna to move to the attendees now. And I remind everyone, if you're gonna speak, say your name, your address, and um, you do have up to, to three minutes, but you know, think of everyone's time um, and try to be efficient with your uh, speaking. And then just try to remute yourself after you're done. So at this point, I'm only seeing one hand. Um, if there's any other people who wanna to speak tonight, there's some more hands going up now. Okay. So I'm seeing four hands. Um, and Pam, you're going to work with me mm -hmm. here. I'm going to see the first one is Daniel Finnegan. And I'm going to yes. click allow to talk. Or Pam did good. Um, so welcome. Um, again, just introduce yourself. You're still muted. I can see that. Unmute. 
Can you hear me now? I can. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dan Finnegan. I'm an attorney and I represent Harmsway LLC, which owns the property at 38 Gray Street. Um, just, just, a, just a couple of comments. I just, I just wanted to address the issue that Bucky raised about the um, setback. Um, I know he has a letter from the building inspector. I haven't seen or had a chance to review that letter. I am just going to tell you that I, I just do not see a way in which section 6.6 .6 does not apply to this project. Um, they chose to characterize themselves as an educational use. That was their choice. They got a benefit from characterizing themselves as an educational use. They got to avoid going to the CBA for a special permit. Now they want to turn around and say, for purposes of the dimensional requirements, they're not an educational use. Section 6.6 .6 says, and I'm quoting it, all structures approved after January 1, 1994 by a permit granting authority for educational uses shall have a minimum setbacks twice the distance shown on table three. There's no ambiguity in that. If they're not going to be treated as an educational use for the setback requirement, then they have to go to the planning board for a, excuse me, the zoning board of appeals for a special permit for the, the use in general. They can't have their cake and eat it too. They can't be treated as an educational use for one circumstance, one section of the bylaw, and not as an educational use for another. So I just wanted to point that out. I do think as a result of that, they're here prematurely. This needs a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals, given that setback requirement. And I don't think at the end of the day, it's tenable, again, to say that they get to characterize themselves as educational in one circumstance and not educational in another. So that's the only issue I have tonight. I may want to speak again after reviewing the letter um, or on some other issues uh, when the hearing reconvenes on the 15th, if that's okay with the, uh, with the board. And I think there are other representatives, uh, Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design, who may want to speak tonight as well. Thank you. Um, I next see Demetria Shabazz, if we allow. Great. Welcome. Ms. Shabazz. Hmm. I don't know why we're not hearing you. You are don't appear to be muted. Muted. Hmm. Ms. Shabazz, are you there? Whoa. Pam, are you doing that? I am not. Hmm. Interesting. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, it took a while to figure out. I don't know what's going on. Uh, thank you. I am Demetria Shabazz. I am uh, the president of the board of directors at Amherst Media. And I just wanted to uh, thank you all um, for reviewing our new plan. It's been a little over a year since March 2019 when we met with this body and sought approval for our design. As you can see, we've taken your advice. I remember Maria stating very um, you know, succinctly that we needed some experts uh, to help us out. Appreciate that. Sought help from the experts in the field, Gillen and Associates and Architects. And of course, you, you saw our brilliant engineer, Bucky. And uh, carefully and thoughtfully, we created an attractive and what we feel is a suitable building. Uh, we brought this new design to the Historic Commission through several meetings. The LHDC made substantive uh, suggestions that in the end, we feel the, made the project better. We have a design that meets our needs and respects the well, we just lost you. And we hope the planning board in the end agrees so that we can begin building our long awaited home. And I just wanted to say again, thank you. Thank you. All right, I see four more hands. So I'll go to Matthew uh, Massengill. Do you see that, Pam? I'll I do. Um, 
He should be ready. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Matt Messingill. He's muted. Yeah, wow. How about now? Yes, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Okay. So um, I just have some, since it's the first night, I just have some uh, just some general thoughts about um, some of the things that. Sir, can you introduce yourself and give your address first? And then. Yeah, my name's Attorney Matthew Massengill. I'm an, I live at 1277 Southeast Street. I also represent Harm's Way, uh, the owners of the Hill House. Okay, thank you. I want to clarify just a couple of points um, and a couple of concerns I have. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the owners of the Hill House, that's a single family residence. That's not a bed and breakfast. Okay. It is um, uh, Robert and Tony um, are raising their, their small children at the house. Um, and, and they are good neighbors. They are not suing the town of Amherst nor are Robert and Tony suing the local historic district. Amherst Media is suing the local historic commission and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, all right? I want to make sure the people understand that we shouldn't just assume, because I heard it several times tonight, that the neighbors are well-funded. Bucky has made it a point in letters and telling you tonight how Amherst, uh, that my clients have all this money and that they are just spending this money and hiring whomever they want to do whatever they want. My clients are good neighbors. They want, um, they want a nice resolution to this property. They are not the issue. And this, when the board and members and when Bucky turns this around and says that Amherst, uh, that Amherst Media is totally innocent, but the clients up the hill are causing problems. It's just unfounded. And just one last point: this this letter from Rob Mora. I don't I don't understand why this was not presented to the public. If Bucky got a letter from Rob Mora, the town should have either posted this letter or circulated the letter. They knew that we were around and we would like to see what he had to say. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. The next uh, in the queue I see is a Felicity Hardy. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Uh, hi. Uh, I, uh, I uh, do use my um, professional name, Felicity Hardy, but uh, actually this evening I'm speaking as a resident of Amherst, and in that uh, regard, I'm known as Felicity Barry, so I use my married maiden home. I live at 574 Station Road in Amherst. Welcome. Um, like, uh, thank you. I'd like to make a point about the parking um, for further consideration and deliberation by the board uh, when it next convenes. And that is that while Mr. Sparkle has suggested that this site plan uh, presents eight parking spaces, in fact, it's quite a few fewer parking spaces um, because there are four parking spaces that run along the north side of the parcel that will be immediately adjacent to the retaining wall. And so what will happen with those parking spaces is that the drivers will be able to exit the cars, but nobody else would be able to exit the cars. So, you know, I think it's, he's drawn in lines to indicate that there are eight spaces, but in fact, all of the spaces on the north side are essentially unusable because they can only be accessed by the driver because they're parallel parking and they're going to be against a retaining wall, which is right against the property line. So uh, I'm sure there are going to be many other comments um, and concerns raised during the course of this hearing, um, but that's one that I'd like to get on the table um, at the outset, which is Amherst Media really is supposed to be building 15 parking spaces. They're proposing eight, and in fact, at least four are essentially unusable. Thanks for your time this evening. Thank you. 
The next in the queue, I see a uh, Chris uh, Chamberlain, and I'll turn you on. Oops. There we go. Are we? Am I on now? You are, uh, Chris. Love these, love these pandemic public hearings. <laughs> um, Doing the so best I, you can. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm, yourself, please. Yes, I will. Uh, I'm Chris Chamberlain. I'm a professional engineer with Berkshire Design Group. Uh, I, Bucky made reference uh, to a couple of the letters that I wrote um, a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I am uh, was brought on um, by some of the budding property owners to do an engineering review of plans. Um, and uh, despite working for um, folks who, who, as it's known, are, are opposing the project, you know, as an engineer, I've got a professional obligation toward objectivity, just like Bucky does, um, representing his applicants. Um, and so in those letters, you know, sort of take the, uh, the point of, uh, just like we would for a peer review on behalf of the town, um, really just trying to make sure that the board has the perspective of what an engineer might see in some of the plans uh, and how they compare with good engineering practice and some of the bylaw standards. Um, and so we submitted uh, a couple of letters. Uh, we received Bucky's responses to some of them. Uh, he addressed uh, the comments that we made, uh, sometimes uh, in, in ways that reasonably resolved them. Um, in other cases, there's still components that, that we see as problematic. And I just wanted to highlight um, the couple that, that stand out for us still. Um, the first one is the retaining wall uh, on the north side of the property. Um, you know, we've got concerns about the constructability of that wall as it's presented. Um, it's a five foot retaining wall um, supporting a neighboring property, uh, which has a large tree at the top, also a driveway. Um, a, the way the plans are drawn, it appears as though that's to be built with a seven foot unsupported cut, which is pretty concerning right along a property line. Um, and, you know, one of our recommendations was that a supportive excavation plan be provided to show how that um, work can be done safely. Um, the, the comment, the, the response to the comment that we got was uh, that the contractor is confident that the wall can be built. I've worked with a lot of contractors in my career. I know Bucky has too, and sometimes those promises fall short. Um, nothing bad to say about the contractor on board. They are a good group. Um, and then regarding the design, um, you know, we'd be curious if uh, the submitted site plan is the only stamped plan of the wall that's going to be submitted. Um, if it is, you know, the, the design doesn't detail any of the uh, assumptions or loading requirements or assumptions about the soil pressures. Um, it, the, the issue is if this wall were in the middle of the site, it's something that could be probably solved down the road. Uh, but if the wall has to move at all as the result of design changes, uh, it impacts the parking lot, which is already um, tight and problematic, which is the, the second piece that, that I wanted to, to touch on. Um, you know, the bylaw requires that uh, parking lots have, quote, adequate access and maneuvering areas. Um, and we identified a number of concerns on, along those lines in our initial letter. Um, you know, the, among the responses that were given was that an 18-foot driveway is provided, and that's what was required. That's all well and good, but driveways and access aisles are not necessarily the same thing. And those dimensions are minimums, but the standard is still the maneuverability. Um, you know, we pointed out that some of the tracking analysis that was provided in the plans shows that it actually is quite difficult um, to get in and out of this parking lot. Um, the response to that comment was that, well, it's a full-size passenger vehicle, like a full-size pickup truck. Uh, to you know, and and so we would uh, reply that yes, it, it shows that there's problematic uh, maneuvering with a full-size passenger vehicle. Um, it was also uh, responded that it's really only a problem if the parking lot is full, and it's uh, almost never going to be full. Um, but you know, I, as you know, my opinion is that, that if the parking lot's not maneuverable when it's full, then it's then it's not functional. Um, and even in that case. Uh, if there were four or five vehicles parked in the right spots, it may still act as full, even if it's not actually full. Um, and so, you know, we, we see that as, as you know, not nit nitpicky stuff, but really fundamental to, to the site plan here. Um, and then, you know, finally, touching on the stormwater management system, you know, obviously, Sir, I can just lot. let you know you're four oh. minutes in. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just, no. Engineer. 
it is my last point um, is you. that with the stormwater management plan, you know, commend Bucky on doing a lot of work on, on this project. Um, but, you know, we raised the concern about the initial stormwater uh, calculations didn't account for the uphill flow onto the site. Um, that was uh, revised and he did look at that. But at the end of the day, I know uh, Jason Skills uh, is comfortable with it and, and that's fine. Um, but the stormwater analysis does show that in the two and the 10 year storm uh, runoff has increased from the site, which is, which is not the standard. Um, it's sort of up to the, the board uh, how to see that. Um, so those are just the things I wanted to highlight. Um, you know, we've got uh, the last response letter today. We may fill in some more detail before the next hearing. We'll see. Um, thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, next, I see uh, Elsie Fetterman. You can unmute your, yep, there you are. You should be set. Yeah, I'm Elsie Fetterman uh, on Logtown Road had been a resident of Amherst for over 40 years. And I just wanna say that I really depend on Amherst media for everything that's going on. I'm 93 years old and I find all of their services are just so wonderful. And then I just recently, they just got a, an award. They got a grant from the Humanities Council to produce a documentary about Holocaust survivors starting a temple and the kind of work that they're doing. And I just want to say, I went to practically every one of the meetings of the Historical Commission and I heard Bill Gillen, I heard the different presentations. And I just want to know if there's anything I can do as a community member of over 40 years to let everyone know, whether it's a planning board or anyone else, how valuable Amherst Media is to Amherst. Thank you for calling in. I see one last hand. Um, uh, Christopher Gadera. And this is the last hand I see in the public comment for tonight. Okay, are you there, Mr. Gadera? Yes, I am. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the one I just wanted to say one point, which is, um, uh, well, actually two. One is that um, uh, I, I don't want to assume that everybody knows the um, the experience of Berkshire design with water flow and management. They're the ones who corrected the problem that had been caused in the first place there. Um, I didn't say that uh, uh, the properties, two properties that abut this, I manage, my family owns, 14 Gray Street to the north and 446 Main Street to the east are both our properties. So um, the, the one thing I wanna say though is that um, what was not mentioned before when there was uh, talk about if, if Amherst Media doesn't get to build this, if it doesn't get approved, then it'll be sold and two more residential buildings will go up. Um, I, I, what perhaps could have also been mentioned then is the fact that one, uh, one or more neighbors have offered to purchase repeatedly this property and donate half of it, if I'm not mistaken, donate half of it to the town, the part where the building is going up and keeping the other half uh, donating that first half as a park area to let, be left open and leaving the other part open as their own property. So um, I, I don't know if this is news to anybody in this meeting, but this has been brought up many, many times. So I'm surprised that that this was not presented and instead it was presented as, um, as uh, other buildings will go up. That's my only point. Thank you. Thank you. So I see no other hands at this point. I'm going back to the board. Um, I'm checking, all right, so time, it's, it's 9.41. Um, we've been over three hours into this and we still have other things for tonight. Um, I suggest at this point we, um, oh, not, we're not close, we're postponing or uh, rescheduling it for the 15th. Are there any board members who would like to make a motion? I also throw out there, Chris Bestrup, is there anything you want to say? Um, should we 
reiterate any things that we're hoping that will come back to us um, for next time? Um, I think I'm going to um, look at the development application report and probably revise it. I think we submitted a, um, a draft development application report and we've received a lot of extra information um, tonight. And uh, so we're going to do that. And I also wanted to, um, you know, remind people that um, they can always email me or call me to say, um, what's the latest information that you've received? So we're not holding back any information. We're not posting this information on the website um, like we do for some really big projects. But um, if anybody wants information, they can certainly um, email me and I'll be happy to send it to them. Okay. The only thing I could think of is um, maybe some more details, uh, Mr. Sparkle, on this retaining wall, just how high it is. We were hearing people say five feet, yet when we were at the site visit, I know parts sounded more like we're only two feet high. So maybe if we could have a drawing um, showing the elevations. Are you there, Mr. Sparkle? Yes, I, I do hear you, Christine, uh, that you're interested in perhaps an elevation view of the retaining wall. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth our going out there and reevaluating the grade as we know that there was a construction through there. And it seems to me that the elevation is actually now lower, which would lower the height of the retaining wall. Um, but that all just happened. So I can definitely bring that to the uh, next meeting. I, I expect, I think I can get uh, that information done. and. Um, uh, at least uh, an elevation drawing done. Um, and if I could have a, a minute or two just to briefly uh, address the public comments, I and mean, normally I get a bunch of time and I know we're gonna have uh, another meeting on this and it's late, uh, but it's also fresh. Uh, may, I, may I do that, Christine? Sure. All right, thank you. Um, just the things that caught my attention, um, you know, uh, Daniel Finnegan, the attorney, uh, would like to see Rob Moore's letter. I'm happy to provide it. I would be quoting it now as to say his reasoning, but I, I think it's sound reasoning why the uh, educational use does not necessarily, uh, necessarily apply to each and every application. So section 6.6 .6, um, uh, is, is not a blanket statement according to, to Rob. And that's, those are my words that paraphrase. Um, I, I, uh, we heard from attorney Matt Mazengill, the second attorney um, for this presumably not well-funded abutter, and they uh, talked about Anders Media's causing problems and causing lawsuits. This is a very convoluted situation that I know I am not uh, you know, in, in the legal note to talk about, and if we do need to get into legal concerns, it would be great to know that so we can be sure that our attorney is able to address those things because I know I'm not qualified. It is not just as simple as uh, Amherst Media being some Sue happy organization. They are not a well-funded organization. Um, and we heard from um, Felicity Hardy, who uh, is going by another name. I didn't jot that down. I apologize, Felicity. Uh, as a resident, of course, she was uh, previously the another, the third attorney representing Harm's Way, but tonight she's not speaking uh, as that and did talk about parking spaces. Um, the, those parking spaces are a little extra wide and there is a green strip buffer between the pavement and the wall. So there is adequate space to get out. It is, uh, again, I talked at the same meeting, it's a, it's a tight parking lot, but it will work. Uh, and of course, most people in this country drive around with just one person in the car and all those individuals would be, uh, the drivers are easy to get out. Um, uh, the matter of retaining wall constructability with Berkshire Design Group. I mean, we're talking about matters of opinion here, uh, technical opinion. Uh, we'll try and provide more information. Um, and we also talked about stormwater. We can get into that. Um, if we do allow, and we don't have to, we could just let the neighbor's water go around our site and just ice up the sidewalk. That We can do that. We don't want to do that. Um, so we are achieving uh, discharge rates during uh, very heavy storms, the two-year and the 10-year storms of 106% and 102% of the ideal guideline for discharge. So smaller storms than that, which are most storms, uh, aren't, aren't going to have that problem. 
And um, one way to fix the problem is to just let that water run around our site, but it makes a lot more sense to put it underground, not have it go over the sidewalk and put it back into the ground uh, through groundwater recharge. Uh, we heard about purchase offers. Uh, it's true offers have been made. As Jim Lesko said earlier this evening, those offers were substantially undervalued and that's just the cost of the land. It doesn't include the, the time and effort and multiple building designs, years of design development, professionals like myself that have been involved, uh, attorneys that have unnecessarily and unfortunately had to be involved, uh, as well as the fact that Amherst Media is uh, being evicted from their current place. And they don't have a lot of options now. And they've been trying for years. I think it looked at over two dozen locations. So uh, the, the amount of money that somebody could just come in and right away Amherst Media's investment and problems and the, the stakes that it would be facing and potentially ceasing to exist, there's no monetary offer anywhere near that um, that I am aware of, uh, as well as the fact that the town is not interested in owning a park here. So it, it's not really, a, I mean, that's um, it's a red herring, is that the word? Um, but uh, thank you for allowing me to address those few uh, public comments, which were almost exclusively from representatives of harm's way. And we'll come back next time with some more information on the retaining wall as far as height and elevation. Uh, is there anything else that I can do for the board tonight? Um, thank you for that response. I usually look for the hand raise and I did, and maybe you're not, yeah, we're having our tech. So thank you for speaking up. Oh. Um, oh. So great. Um, and <coughs> Stay there, Mr. Sparkle, because I'm going to an, um, call on some board members and they might have some additional suggestions or questions for you. Yes. So at this point, I see uh, Janet, Doug, and Michael. So I'll call on Janet first. Hello. Um, so I just want to say at the beginning is that I see the planning board as enforcing the bylaws requirements and approving projects that meet them. And that's the requirement we have in site plan review is that the, the project has to conform with the bylaws requirements. And so that's sort of my framing or understanding of, of what, what I'm doing here, what we're doing here. Um, I, I have a bunch of, just a few issues I'd like to bring up. Um, so hopefully we can talk about them next week uh, or in two weeks. Um, I was very concerned about the um, section 6.6, .6, about whether it was a 10 foot setback or 20, or if we were in special permit or site plan review. Um, so I would like to see Rob Moore's letter and understand that because at first blush, um, I thought that was, con that was concerning. I also looked at this very late in the afternoon. Um, I had a question, you know, because I know how important this view of the Henry Hills house, I know, I know um, and I was wondering if the building could be pulled a little bit closer to Gray Street and what, you know, if that was considered or rejected or the, um, with the historic commission about that. Um, I do want to say that I drive by ACTV all the time and there are very few cars in the parking lot, like noticeably few. Um, the other thing I'm kind of concerned about, and I have really no way of dressing with my background is the stormwater issues and I understand Jason Skeels and saying, well, we don't usually model uphill watershed, you know, water, water coming off of uphill sites and not being concerned about that. And I appreciate the effort to try to take the water from those two lots. I also was driving around on Thursday by Hospital Hill because I was, I was driving by and I thought, oh, this is, you know, a 40R project with form-based zoning. I think I'll take a look at it. And at the bottom of Hospital Hill on the west side, there were about 10 neighbors, all with umbrellas, and there was a huge pile of water at the bottom, like right in front of the last house. And it was such so deep that I didn't want to go through with my forester. And I thought nobody designed this project thinking this would happen. And it wasn't, I mean, I'm sure they had a cloud burst. I'm sure it was intense. Um, but I just, I don't, I can't address those stormwater issues, but I really, those are important to me that the project really hold together. So I'd like more information or more back and forth or um, some consideration for that. If there's serious questions, I don't have a way of resolving them, but I'm very interested in that. And um, so I think that's pretty much it for what I can see. Um, but I, I do recognize that this property really has been in contention for a long time. You know, it, it came to us in town meeting to rezone. 
the historical commission wanted to buy it, but the price, they couldn't meet the price of the previous owner. And there's a lot of feeling on this. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I was completely dreading this project because I just had been, I voted against the rezoning in town meeting. I love that view. And I have to say that I am very impressed by what we're looking at. It's, it's, you know, it's, you know, being on the site and looking around and I can see the effort and time and thoughtfulness, uh, you know, and the seven hearings produce something, you know, so I appreciate the effort of the historic commission and ACTV and everybody. So thank you. Okay. Um, and now I recognize Doug and then there'll be Michael. Okay. I, uh, I wanted to say to Bucky that for the next meeting, I would like to have very detailed information about the tiebacks that are used to stabilize the retaining wall and uh, some clarity about the relationship of those tiebacks to the property line, since I assume you need to keep them on your side of the property line in order to uh, not run afoul of the neighbor who is clearly uh, not excited about the project. Um, secondly, it sounded like Christine was looking for a motion to continue the, the conversation to another meeting. Uh, am I right, Christine, that it was- Yes, the, you are. Is it the July 15th meeting? Yes. Oh, that's gonna be another fun one. Um, Aren't they all? Chris, yeah. do we have a time that we well, can yeah. nail this to? Yeah, so, okay, I'll make a motion that we continue the hearing to uh, July 15th meeting, um, and I'll end my comments there. Thank you. And if Chris, you can add a time. I think time? that's gonna be 635. We do not have any other public hearings scheduled for that night, unless Pam um, corrects me about that. And if, uh, I'll take a not shout- Not that I'm aware of, Chris. <laughs> okay. I'll take a shout out if someone wants to second that. Well, I, was, I had my hand up. I was gonna make the same motion, so I'll second it. Great, fantastic. Okay, so um, any, so uh, I'll put down Doug's hand and Michael's. So is there any discussion or problem with that? Any hands? I'm not seeing any. Okay, so. Um, Roll call. Yep, I'm looking for my list again. Oh, geez. Uh, Michael? Uh, roll call if you, uh, I don't hear you, Michael. Whoops. Yes. Yes. Maria? Uh, yes. Approved. David? Yes. Jack? Yes. Doug? Yes. Janet? Yes. And myself. So I think that's unanimous. So thank you, um, everyone who came tonight. Um, and we will uh, continue this at 6.35 on the 15th of July. We'll be taking public comment again. And uh, again, as Ms. Bestrup said, people can always reach out to her and I'm sure she'll be in contact with most of these people. Thank you, particularly to Mr. Sparkle. Um, you're welcome. I don't know if you can still hear me, but- Yes, uh, I'll come yes, up still with a new me. microphone. New microphone next time, I promise. And are you still sharing your screen or? Yes. Um, I am, so I can stop that. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> still there. All right. So um, thank you. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yes. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right, so the board will move on to item uh, four, old business. Uh, item A, master plan update and zoning bylaw rewrite discussion about schedules and priorities. Um, Chris, would you like to speak on this first or do you want me to speak or? Well, I can speak very briefly, um, which is to say that um, there's been a lot of work that the uh, planning board, planning department staff has been doing on things other than the master plan and the zoning bylaw rewrite. We've been working very hard to help the businesses downtown to um, get started again so that they can, um, you know, come back out of this uh, COVID-19 epidemic. So really, we haven't done much on the master plan since um, March 
18th, I think, and more recently we did talk a little about it. We have received comments from planning board members. And um, so uh, that's all I can really say about the master plan. The zoning bylaw rewrite seems to be really more um, of a priority to uh, people that I've been speaking with, planning board members, um, town council, CRC, and um, just people in general. So um, we've been considering uh, kind of uh, putting the master plan potentially in a little bit of a holding pattern and um, moving on to the zoning bylaw, which I think, you know, in the end, everybody is really eager to um, make changes to the zoning bylaw, including myself and um, Rob Moore, the building commissioner. So that's all I really have to say about that. Um, so maybe Christine can, uh, can carry on from here. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm sure as the other members have been giving us a lot of thought. Um, so if we zip back in time before COVID and last year, and we were trying to sort of um, sort ourselves out on our priorities and, and what we wanted to focus on, but yet we also got some direction from the town council and CRC, which was that town council's desire was to have a master plan update, which is needed to be done, um, and was overdue, but they wanted an update so that they would feel more comfortable with adopting the current master plan. And with that adoption, then they were going to be willing to um, feel more confident in moving forward in bylaw changes. Well, a lot has happened since then. And my feeling is that I would like to put the master plan update on a hold. Um, and potentially for like a year, because even if we were working on an update, we're not sure how we're going to come out on the other side of this COVID thing, when it's going to end, when we're going to get back to normal, or what kind of economic development damage is happening or um, what the situation will be. So I think in some ways we're smarter just to wait. But with that, what I'm asking you all is what are your thoughts about us voting and having a recommendation to town council to say, hey, can you rethink this um, and remove this sort of request you put on us? And we would like to focus on getting bylaw changes done over the next year. So that's my little statement and please raise your hands and I'll call on you. I see David. Um, I'll call on David. He's the only hand I see right now. Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I would support that and, and I'd be willing to make a motion to move this thing along. Um, I, I think that uh, Chris and the planning department's time is the most valuable resource the town has for planning right now. And that that's time that's not well spent um, uh, revising the master plan with kind of really uh, updates and cosmetic kind of things. I, I thought, it, I think it's in the charter perhaps that's part of the motivation for the master plan update. But I, I would um, urge the, the master plan be put aside, that the draft revision Chris sent be sh sent to the town council so they could see the kinds of work that would be involved in doing anything like that and how really unnecessary, how it doesn't move the ball forward. Um, in, in that the town council needs to wrestle with contentious issues, whatever they may be. Um, uh, that's and and then and then provide the priorities for the zoning law zoning zoning updates. The master plan update is not going to again move that materially forward. That's what I would support as well. Thank you. Thank you. I see Janet McGowan's hand up. Um. So we have a master plan and we've approved it and it's in effect. And so um, what was interesting to me about reading for the master plan was how much was left to implement, like the section 10 implementation stuff. And so, you know, we went through that. I mean, we should be updating the master plan every three to five years and all that stuff, but we have a master plan that needs implementa implementing. It's, you know, when you read that chapter, it's full of good ideas. Um, you know, looking at Christine's breast reps first draft, she didn't have that many revisions to the master plan, more kind of like, oh, what's next, next steps or implementation steps. And so, um, I don't know what I'm saying at this point, but it, I, I would love to see us go to like the MOPEC, which, you know, the master plan implementing committee 
which actually will lead to zoning bylaw changes because the master plan is full of ideas for zoning bylaw changes. So I think we have a good working plan. Um, you know, the planning department wanted to take most of the responsibility for the update, but life has really changed in the last few months as we can all see. And so maybe that's not such a great, you know, idea or process right now. So I'm all for implementing the master plan that we have, the planning board has approved and looking at that section 10 implementation and using that as well as, you know, the zoning subcommittees, you know, that, that matrix that we had and, and the planning department's ideas of where the problems are and really just focusing in on implementing the master plan, bylaw changes, whatever. So, you know, I think I'm agreeing. So that's it. Okay, I don't see other, any other hands. So I guess I'm thinking, can we make a recommendation, something like request for them to consider adopting the approved master plan the way it is for now, and let's get through these times and focus on bylaw changes and that we can revisit this at a later time and, and they can determine that too. How would that sound as a recommendation that we could vote on and then forward to them? Sounds good. Okay, so I'll take that maybe as a second. And Chris, a second on the motion. Written down, is there anything else we'd want to include in that? Um, can't think of anything right now. Okay. Sounds good to me. Uh, okay, so I'll take a roll call vote on this. Wait, wait a minute, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah. Who mm -hmm. made that motion? This. Christine Gray Mullen made the I motion. Yes, I did. David yeah. seconded. Uh, okay. Excuse me, I have a hand up before oh. you start voting. I think then several there are several hands up. They yeah. popped up since my last time because I try to watch, but um, so David's down. Okay, so I see Michael, Jack, and then Doug. So Michael. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, we're going in the right direction with uh, <laughs> diminishing the importance of the master plan revision and increasing the importance of zoning bylaw change. However, there are two caveats here. One is that Janet's point about implement the implementation matrix is really important. And I think we really need to do something with that. Now, whether that needs to be done by the existing zoning subcommittee or whether that we need to have an, an, uh, another implementation subcommittee, I don't know. But I think that if we're gonna really pay attention to what the master plan is, even though we're not gonna revise it right now, I think we really need to look at the implementation of it and, and follow through where that leads us, which partly will lead us to zoning changes, but not entirely. Now, as for zoning changes, uh, are you suggesting uh, uh, when we focus on zoning change, uh, the kind of wholesale zoning bylaw revision that Rob Moore is working on, or are you suggesting specific individual things that might come out of the existing zoning subcommittee, four or five of which are already sort of in process? What do you, what do you mean by focusing on zoning changes? I think it could be from either or all or other sources. I think Rob Mora is trying to continue to do his recodification. Um, and I know CRC and town councilors are, they, they themselves are getting um, fired up to do some bylaw changes. And I think COVID situation is making us realize we really need to address some of this sooner than later. Um, we for zoning bylaw are mostly just a recommendation um, committee for that kind of thing. But um, I, I think I'm just saying that we want to free up uh, Miss Bestrup and town resources. This affects them even more than us for them to be able to have the bandwidth to work on zoning. Um, and that we're willing to let go of some of our demands for what is in our purview, which is the master plan and say, Let's just wait a little while. Now, just to address your first part on chapter 10, the um, master plan M um, MPIC implementation committee, that is more in our purview actually, Michael. And I would propose that over the next month or two, we talk about that chapter because we still, we're trying to free up Chris's and, and the planning department's time, but we could still amongst ourselves be picking through that and figuring out, well, what can be done in the next year? Maybe, maybe it can't be done, but maybe some can start. And then that is our world. So we can address that, but I'm trying to just sort of move the update and 
and open up for bylaw. Did that make sense? Yes. Now I understand what you're really talking about. That's fine. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so I see Jack, I see Doug, and I see David, and I see Janet. So I, Jack? Um, I would um, offer that as opposed to just, you know, pushing back and no changes, maybe simplifying it to a minimal sort of edit effort where I'm thinking like the 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 use of end notes uh, just to reference the plans that they want to see referenced. I mean, just something that would only take maybe 10 hours of somebody's time to put in some end notes to satisfy what their major concerns were that there's just plans out there that exist and and uh, you know put you know stay away from major edits but maybe that would satisfy the the CRC and town council is, is all just a very very minimal effort to you know reference using end notes or footnotes Oh. And I just um, counter that with the thought of you could be right, but can we just tell them we want to put it on hold and then see what they come back? Maybe they will come back and say, we're not comfortable with adopting it the way it is. We want this, this, and this. But I just want to remind everyone that this master plan update was supposed to be a kiss. Keep it simple. It was supposed to be minimal. And I think what Ms. Bestrup found is even minimal and simple still is a large amount of her time and other staff that she would have to draw from for resources and updates. Mm -hmm. So I'm just proposing, you could be right, Jack, but right now for our motion that's on right now, could we just push back to them and then see what they want? Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. So I'll call on the other members and maybe they have, you know, please play with, you know, think about this, how, what should we do? Doug is next, then David, then Janet. Yeah, I wanted to, or I guess I'll, I'll just say that I support the motion because it seemed like in the conversations we've had about the master plan update that we were intentionally avoiding changing what I would call content. Uh, of the master plan. I mean, it was mostly let's get the wording changed from town meeting to town council and and then reference whatever products we've done in the last 10 years, which are already on the on our planning board or other town websites. Uh, they're already public documents. So, you know, since we weren't really going to change anything, you know, substantive from my point of view, you know, why not just stop? Thank you. Thank you. You did make me remember one other part that town council wanted. And Chris, maybe you know where the status is, but they really wanted environmental and green issues to be included in this mass plan. That would be one of the parts that it got updated. And with that, they have that committee that's working on a report that pre-COVID was supposed to be done in May and June. And then last I heard now they're thinking November, December. So you know, that that's pushing this even longer too, which as Doug just said, that would still be, if they approve that report, it's still a standalone report that is useful and there, whether or not it's referenced in the current master plan. But Chris, what group is so that? That could be, that could be incorporated by reference once it's um, been finished. There is a real push on this summer to work on that. Um, there's, there was supposed to have been a, a meeting on Tuesday night which they did record and they're going to um, make it available to a lot of people. And then they're going to have meetings throughout the summer to seek input from staff as well as um, members of the public about what should be in this um, climate action and resiliency plan. So, um, so that is definitely moving along and uh, Stephanie Chico Chicorello and the ECAC are putting a lot of effort into that. Um, so I, I think it would be worthwhile seeing what comes out of that. Stephanie hasn't had a lot of time to go through all of the chapters in our uh, master plan and you know insert things that are relevant. So it could be just that when we get the report from that group, it could be incorporated by reference, just like the housing production plan and the housing market study and all these other plans that we've done. So we might wanna just wait and see what comes out of their efforts. Thanks for that update. 
I see David, and then there's Janet and Michael. Uh, again, I agree with Doug. I think that it there it should be stopped. <laughs> the mass, the work on the master plan, um, uh, perhaps to. Uh, in the recommendation to the town council that that we have a motion to vote on, um, perhaps I could we could add uh, or draw the attention of the town council to the implementation grid and ask them for their you know best wisdom on how to utilize that and and to to further the ends and but that's I think that's sufficient. We need to move past this thank you thanks uh so janet and then michael so um i'm wondering if the next meeting we could take some time to talk about like the implementation of chapter 10 the Mo like mopec the master plan implementing committee and maybe um if rob mara could either send information to the zoning subcommittee about what he's working on or to the planning board or both of us just to see what's happening. And then not maybe the next meeting, but at some point to have Stephanie come in and give us a sense of what they're working on. Because it does seem a little odd that you just get at the chapter at the end and not know a little bit more about the process and things like that. And then my final plug is that we do need to get some kind of, there's so many plans out there. When I was looking at the master plan, I kept been finding new plans. And a lot of great kind of small plans. And so I wonder, you know, maybe we, should, we can talk about it later, but just putting them into the master plan and we can just add them in a more easy, accessible way or someplace where you can find them all. So that's it. Thanks. Michael. Um, I, I, I think what I was going to say is probably not relevant anymore. So I'll just put my hand down. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, Chris Bester, your hands up. So I wanted to report on uh, Rob Mora, Rob Mora, Mora's efforts. Um, you know, he met with you in February, and I think he met with you again in March. Um, since then, we've had COVID-19. He's, again, also been working very hard with the um, merchants and the restaurants downtown, um, putting in a tremendous amount of effort in, you know, setting up tables, setting up barriers, making sure that they operate in a healthy manner. He's in charge of the um, health inspectors, um, putting his um, his staff out there to help. And, and he's really feeling like he's probably not going to be able to devote a lot of effort to the zoning bylaw until towards the end of the summer. Because, you know, right now he's doing all his regular work, plus this huge effort to get the downtown back up and running again. So, you know, that's being realistic about it. Um, that's what I have to report. <laughs> Thanks for the and, update. Yeah, in terms of Stephanie, we can certainly invite her to come to um, a meeting. And if you wanted to invite her to the July 15th meeting, I could do that. But I wanted to remind everybody that we did also talk about um, bringing back uh, Chapter 40R on July 15th. So we can certainly put off Chapter 40R, or we could put off a discussion of the master plan. It's really probably going to be one or the other because we're going to have to dive back deep into Amherst Media on the 15th, and that's probably going to take, you know, an hour and a half or two hours. I agree. I think we should pick one or the other, either the 40R or the master plan discussion. Um, I do see Michael's hand up next. I'll call on him. But any, after Mike, you know, if anyone else has an opinion of which we should deal with first. Yeah, Mike, it's not so much about that. Um, it sounds to me like both Rob Morris busyness with other things, which re reduces his interest or his ability to get, make progress on the zoning revision and the difficulty uh, with uh, the planning department with moving ahead with, uh, by, with uh, rewriting the master or re re the rewrite light of the master plan seems to me that now we have a, uh, two things that were major events on our schedule, which really aren't going to be quite so pressing as they, as they were. And that seems to me to be an opportunity to do two things. One is to see whether, see, try to figure out in what way this environmental uh, action stuff ought to fit into the master plan, whether as little pieces of other existing units or whether as chapter 11 all by itself. 
which is a possibility, it seems to me. We're not limited to the 10 chapters of the master plan. Those are suggested chapters, things that should be there, but they're not necessarily the only things that have to be there. The other, other possibility is to follow up on what Janet was talking about, is really working seriously on the implementation matrix. And I think we can do that as a, as a board without really involving, at least at the beginning, the heavy, uh, heavy lifting from the, from the planning staff seems to me we can have a good discussion about what the implementation matrix can do and isn't doing, uh, and then kind of figure out where we might want to go with it, whether we want to go further with it or just leave it for the next master plan. But at least we can get started on, on that issue, I think, without heavy involvement with, from staff. So may I just cut in for a minute and ask, are you suggesting that you do that on July 15th? Not, necess not necessarily. Uh, I think one of the two suggestions that have already been made about July 15th are, are perhaps more pressing. Uh, but this could be uh, July, well, August. August. Something about, in August? Okay. How about we get this Chapter 10 rolling in August? And that gives everybody a little bit of time. I know we've all read the master plan and have comment, but to give the chapter 10 a real good read with a focus of thinking of the times we live in right now and, you know, what can we do to be useful and helpful. Um, so I see no other hands. So 40R, we'll bring that back uh, in two weeks and have a talk about that. I think we need to sort of get settled on what we're doing with that too. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other option beside 40R? The Amherst Media Project. Yeah. No, no, but there was one other thing that might come back. I said either the master plan or 40R. Right. Okay. Or we could also have Stephanie come and talk about oh, that group's yeah. report. That's right. Which I think that could get probably get put off till August also. Okay. Just, so if we just do the 40R and Amherst Media at the next meeting, if that makes sense. Okay, good. I'm seeing thumbs up, so that's good. Um, so we need to vote on this recommendation um, to send to town um, council. Um, so it, if this, uh, any more comments or can I do a roll call? Can we repeat what that recommendation is? I'm a little confused as to what exactly yeah. we're okay. recommending now. Um, do you have that, Chris? I have to look through my notes. Yeah. That, uh, it, that the planning board would like to put the master plan update on a hold during this time. And that we do that knowing that it was the town council that requested we take on this initiative uh, for this year because they wanted an updated master plan to adopt. And we're asking them for their uh, thoughts on putting this on hold and what would they be willing to adopt the current master plan and then just see what they say. And maybe they'll ask, like Jack was saying, they'll still have some requests. They know what the environmental and climate resiliency report that's going on. That was part of what they were waiting on. Um, okay, Chris, do we have to make a motion out of this? Yeah, so uh, all that, of that. No, 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 up but just up to the point where I said that we're asking for the we're giving a recommendation so, that we put it on hold and that um that we we are asking this knowing that they were the ones that asked us asked asked for us to take on this initiative last year as a priority because they wanted an updated master plan to adopt. So we also secondly asked them if they would be willing to adopt the current master plan in these times, or please advise us. Um, Pam and I can get together and put some wording <laughs> together and uh, we'll send it to you and you can look at it. But the gist but of it, I think you've got the gist of it. Yep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so if we, run with that right now and we have a second. We've had discussion. I'll call on Jack and then I see Michael. Yeah, I was just wondering in addition to the COVID and all that um, pressing <laughs> staff for time, is there not, um, are we looking at 
you know, budgetary problems when we, we don't we don't have an economic director right now. We probably won't have. I mean, aren't aren't there a lot of other things that we could be uh, presenting to the town council of, of, as why this <coughs> be put on hold? Well, I'll tell you one really good reason it's been put on hold for us, in addition to all the COVID stuff, we also have, um, I feel like we've got two big rabbits moving through the snake right now. We've got Amherst Media, and we've got the Valley CDC project at 132 Northampton Road. And that is taking a tremendous amount of time of the planning department and has for the last month, at least. The Zoning Board of Appeals is holding public hearings on that right now. It's got a lot of public scrutiny. We want to make sure that the public hearing goes exactly right. So we have meetings with the chairperson of the ZBA and we have meetings internally and we're studying documents and it's just, um, it's a really huge thing that doesn't necessarily rise to the surface of getting in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and we don't talk about it at the planning board very much, but in terms of time spent, um, it is a big time, um, time consumer and it's a very worthwhile time consumer but that's just one of you know other things we do have other things but those two things Amherst Media and the Valley CDC project in addition to the COVID and the restaurants is just like <sighs> big it's a big project <laughs> wait Chris how did you describe that two bun two, rabbits in the snake. rabbits moving through the snake yeah <laughs> The snake the is the process, the snake. and the snake ate the rabbits, and now they have to kind of slowly make their way through the system. And, and now, wait, are you the snake in that? Because you're consuming <laughs> those projects? Stop. I don't want a visual. <laughs> Not enough of that. I've never heard that, 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 that turn of phrase before. Oh, my goodness. I've heard it a million times. <laughs> I hang out with different people, I guess. Um, Michael, you have your hand up. I do. A technical question. A is, is this a request or a letter or whatever this is going to the CRC or going to the council? To the council, because it came from the council that they wanted us to. So we're going to be, it's going to be a long time before we get an answer. Because the council is going to refer to the CRC. <laughs> and then the CRC is going to send it back to the council, and then we'll get an answer. And then, then we'll get an answer in two months at best. So let's send it to both. Let's send it to town council and CRC. So, but it's so effectively, we get what we want. Then uh, that is a pause. Things in limbo. But we can hope, can't but that's we? Only a, that'll be only a two or three month pause. What we're looking for is a longer pause than that, I think, David. But we're yeah. looking for a longer pause, and yeah, effective, we, effective, we've got other we stuff. To, we've got other stuff to work on. So. Yeah. All right, I see no other hands. I'm gonna take a roll call. Um, Michael? Yes. Uh, David? Yes. Jack? Yes. Janet? Yes. Maria? Yeah. And myself, yes. <laughs> and Doug, yeah. you forgot about Doug. And <laughs> Doug, you know, the things are bouncing. Sorry, Doug, oh, he's Hi. best for last. But you well, not if you forget. <laughs> Well, I was trying to go down the right. I probably should have just gone through the screens, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, and Doug? Sorry. No? Yes? No? Yes. You can always just, you know. Um, so now with Doug, yes, that's seven. Yes, good. Thank you. If you could um, draft that up and just send it out to us so we see it mm -hmm. before it goes to them. Okay. Um, yep. Great. So if we move on to old business, I'm um, sad to say uh, we have B, there is a topic not recently, uh, reasonably anticipated in 48 hours. Chris? Yes. So this um, has to do with the Applebrook subdivision in South Amherst. And you'll probably remember that it was um, approved as a subdivision back in 2007. And then it came back to the planning board in uh, 2017 and 2018, it came back a couple of times. Um, the most recent, well, one of the most recent things you did was that you uh, released lots, you released all the lots except for um, lot four, and I think that was back in September of 2019. Now, um, Tom Reedy, who represents the owner of the unsold lots there, is coming back and asking us to, um, or asking you, 
to trade one lot for another. Um, one of the lots that was released was lot two and the lot that was held kind of in escrow or it's not really escrow but held so that um, the developer would have an incentive to finish the roadway and this may bring back memories of a different project but forget <laughs> about that other project we're focusing on uh, great, Applebrook right now um, so in any event uh, what Tom Reedy would like to do uh, he has a buyer for his client um, of lot four and um, they would like to close in the middle of July, I think, for that lot four. Um, meantime, he would like to, so lot four is being held uh, in order to make sure that the developer finishes the road. What Tom Reedy would like to do is trade that for lot two. So in other words, put lot two under, a, a, um, under the covenant and that the little uh, cursor is hovering over lot two right now and um, release lot four. So he's given us a letter and a um, covenant that's filled out. I don't know, I did send this to Christine Gray Mullen to ask if we could talk about it tonight. I don't know if I sent it to the rest of you, but Pam has it on the screen here. So Pam can bring up the certificate of performance, which says that um, the lots designated on the plan as follows, lot four prov provided, Lot four would be released, provided, however, that lot two shall be subject to the above identified approval with covenant contract. So what we would need to do is have you vote to trade um, the holding of lot four uh, and release lot four and instead hold lot two. And you'd need to vote that and then you'd need to come in and sign this document um, and I can make arrangements to have to meet you and have you do that. So you have any questions? I see Michael's hand up and then Doug's. Was there any particular reason that lot four was initially chosen to be the covenant covenanted lot? And Pam, I, can you pop the map back up? Mm -hmm. Yes. I did not hear any reason, and I don't remember Tom Reedy giving any reason when he came to talk to you. I think he, they probably didn't know which lots were going to go quick, more quickly than others, and they just chose lot four, maybe because it was at the end of the road, and I, I don't really know. I, I can only speculate. Okay. Doug, and then David. Yeah. Don't we want them to finish the road sooner rather than later? Sounds like we've now got an opportunity. What does that mean? I mean, why would we want to delay finishing this road by hopscotching around the subdivision until there's only one parcel left? Well, one of the reasons that um, that we don't allow or we don't encourage a developer to completely finish the road before um, most of the houses are built because what that means is that the road is going to get really beat up by um, by the construction of the houses and I think there are at least two and maybe three houses that are um, under construction now in this subdivision but um, you know, there are several more that need to be built. So the town engineer is reluctant to say, okay, just go ahead and put the top coat on and finish all the curbs and do everything and, and you know, have the road be finished um, if there's still gonna be a lot of activity on it. So we wanna hold one lot um, to give the developer an incentive. He won't be able to sell that lot until it's released and that will give him an incentive to, um, to finish the road. Does that answer? The question? Yeah, I, I, I get that, and that seems that's a, that's a valid uh, chain of argument. But if that's the case, then why don't we just why do we need to even name a, a lot at all? Why don't we just say the developer can't has to not sell the last lot before finishing the road? Hmm. That's a thought. Well, each lot is um, is recognized on the subdivision plan. I think it would be hard to um, keep track of that. 
Um, this way, the developer has to come back and ask for a release of lot two once um, once he considers the roadway to be done. And I'm not sure that there'd be an easy way to keep track of it otherwise. Okay. And to be frank, this is the way it's always been done. So this is the way I know how to do it. So. <laughs> okay. So this is not an uncommon occurrence. No. This is okay. Holding one lot is not an uncommon occurrence. Trading one lot for another is an uncommon occurrence. But okay. I've gone over this with Rob Mara, the building commissioner, who also develops property in Belchertown, and he didn't think there was any problem with this trade. Okay. David and then Janet. David. You're muted. I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. It was, it was really a year ago at the end of a long meeting, we were presented with, this is really, this is a situation <laughs> which evokes what's being asked here because it evokes what it involves now is, is what's held um, in escrow to guarantee performance of the building of the road without, you know, and that, 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 that decision last year was just like now, we want to get the meeting over with. Um, it sounds like they've, they're, they've got a buyer in the middle of the middle of the month, which is when our next meeting is. And so we're kind of under the gun to make a decision. And I feel very uncomfortable doing it at this point because I don't remember, I wasn't actually a part of the board when this um, cluster, this is a cluster develop, uh, subdivision, cluster development was, was approved. And um, it seems to have also a history of being moribund for a while, like that Amherst Hills or whatever that other one's called. So I'm just uncomfortable with this um, seemingly nonchalant request that, um, I don't. I don't know more about um, at coming late in the evening. Thank you very much. So Tom Reedy is not here, but I could get him on the phone. Would that help? That's only. It's only. It's. I mean, I wouldn't want to anyone to be calling me at ten thirty at night. <laughs> I mean, that's a bad news time call. I'm serious. That's a scary call. That's not nice. I want to, so I, that, I, I, I want to be comfortable um, motivating that request. But uh, so, uh, he asked that, me that, to call that's all, him. that's all, that's my point. Tom Reedy asked me to call him if things didn't go well. And so um, I kind of feel obligated to call him, but on the other hand, maybe he should have been here, <laughs> so. I don't know. Tell me what to do. Um, well, I'll call on Janet. Well, I was going to say ditto to David because I don't. I, I feel like I'm too tired and I don't really know this project, and I'm kind of wondering how. I, it looked to me like most of those buildings were built, but I'm not sure, and I'm just exhausted. I'm wondering how much is a road going to cost? How much does a lot go for? Um, and then. You know, I, I wasn't here for the Amherst Hills decision, but you know, that's had a lot of repercussions that nobody anticipated that. I mean, we've been in meetings now for four hours and I'm feeling a little punch drunk. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I know this doesn't, it, I just agree with what David said. It just doesn't feel right to me. I don't feel like I understand what's going on that much. I mean, are most of these, how many lots were open and how many buildings are there? How much does it cost to, you know, fix the street? how much is a lot worth you know i just you, you, our goal is to protect you know the people who are there and I, i'm not sure i could do it right now based on this information uh, michael uh I, I think for me on the surface of it the switch makes sense on the other hand uh i'm willing to uh defer to the to the lawyers in the group who seem to have a much better sense of what what process ought to be going on. So I think maybe we ought to either get a uh, reading on the phone or postpone this until the next meeting. Yeah. What would you like to do, Christine? 
if Tom asks you to call him and, and we're at it, we're at, I think, I think he, he gets a call. I mean, yeah, give but, him a call. But, but, but it and just doesn't, it, this is not an informed decision. And, and I don't know whether, and not that. Mm. So I see a lot of hands. Yeah. Chris, give him a call and just tell him it's not going well. And I just want to tell the board. Um, I had been waiting to say my concern. I wanted to hear what you guys were thinking. Um, so we're all a little burned from Amherst Hills a little bit on. And so when I hear holding lot, I hear the lot has a value and it costs a certain amount of money to do a road. So if you look at lot four and there's a building circle and the top of the building circle on lot four has a, a drainage easement. That's what that funny shape is. So you can't really build on a, a you know, an e a drainage easement, um, but there's still a lot of building circle left. So you can pretty much see how you could get the house and it's not gonna mess with it. But then if you get on to lot two, Chris that's the same, yeah, I'm gonna just turn off Chris. Talking about the Apple Brook subdivision. Um, yeah. um, so if you go down and look at lot two, that funky shape there, that's also a drainage easement. But the one that, so I, Put some questions out to Chris right before the meeting. This all came through this afternoon, so it wasn't like there was a lot of time. I said, well, I've never, the drainage easement is in the middle of the building circle, so what does that mean? Hence, does value reduce on lot two compared to lot four? So is there less money with that lot knowing it's going to cost a certain amount to fix the road? Does that make sense to people? That was my concern, so I would like some answers on that. Um, Michael, I do see your hand up. I don't know if you have something to say or, oh, and I can't hear you. Yep. I said that does make a lot of sense. Uh, and that's a good reason why lot four and lot two were, were chosen, I guess, as the original, um, uh, uh, lots, uh, to be, or the lot four was chosen as the original lot because it's, it's, it is more buildable in that way. And lot two really seems like it's problematic if, if, if but right, I'm unsure if it is problematic or not. Well, yeah, but from the diagram, from the plan we're looking at, it it's, appears to be problematic. Uh, so, Chris, two things. First, did you get in touch with Mr. Eady? And is well, I can't. Oh, we turned you off. Sorry, Chris. Hold on. Where are you? Sorry. Here I am. Great. There so, you are. Yes. Uh, he. I left a message for him. Okay. But I don't really want him to call me back now. He's gone to bed. You'll have yes. to turn your phone off. Um, so I explained to them, and I don't know if you had gotten an answer. Um, I had talked about the two um, drainage easements. Lot four, it's on the edge of the building circle. And lot two, it kind of drives right into the middle of it. Can you build on a drainage easement? Or what kind of complications does that impact on a design in a building circle? Um, you can't build on the drainage easement, but the drainage easement is so I, I understand your question. Yep. Okay, that's a good question. Yep. Okay. Looks like there are two drainage easements. One is um, protruding from the south and the other one cuts off the Northeast corner. Oh yeah. Lot two. Yeah. So my concern was just that lot two is valued less than lot four, and how much money to finish the road or whatever finish the neighborhood. Do we need the value of a lot four, or is a lot two enough? And will it ever sell? I didn't know how problematic this would be as a lot. Those are good questions. Which means we can't deal with this tonight. So do you just call or talk to Mr. Reedy tomorrow and sort it out what, if they can postpone closings or if we need to meet sooner or whatever? Okay. And I recognize Doug, I see your hand up. Sorry, I was looking over at people. Well, um... First of all, you know, if we want to pick a lot that has more value, just to make sure we're not going to end up short, 
you know, there are other circles out on that plan that don't have any drainage easements in the buildable area. Um, secondly, you know, it's not unknown for closings to be delayed. So I don't exactly. Really Especially think, if you sold something you can't sell. <laughs> well, you know, we haven't been given a lot of notice. I don't think we're in being unreasonable to say <laughs> this needs to be delayed. You know, now obviously we've we've sort of uh, already scheduled our June fifteenth meeting. I hate to say it, but I would be willing to come back and talk more with more people who are more informed a week from tonight if that was really necessary. But again, I feel like we're kind of bending over backwards when we haven't really been, you know, integrated into a process. Mm -hmm. That's all. So Chris, I think you have to have a dialogue uh, mm -hmm. with Mr. Reedy. Michael, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't think we should be coming back for a meeting next week. I think we should put this on our next regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, if and make room for it if we, if we need to, and if if there's a an urgency uh, that they are that they're pressed that they need to do it, uh, fine. But not not under these not under these circumstances, and we need a little more documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think every lot is every lot is has started building except the one behind the lot where we looked at the uh, um, uh, screen porch. Couple of weeks ago, so I can't I can't read what number that is, but it's a little lot of the flag seven. Seven. seven seven yeah, which is probably more valuable than two, yes. if that easement is a, is an issue. So maybe seven is already sold; it just hasn't sold. I think yet. it's already. So Chris, has any of the others not been sold? I do not know which ones have been sold, so we can't choose so we tonight. we need to know that, too. Yeah. yeah, which ones have been sold, which ones are built on, and which ones are still open. And Mr. Reedy will know all that. So, yeah, Chris, give him a call. Uh, David? Yeah, hi. One comment, and then I'll make a motion to continue with us. My comment is that I don't, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem to me to be the board's role. I, I easily could be mistaken to get into the value of this lot over that lot or, or what's been sold and what hasn't been sold. Our interest is, in this case, I believe, is what is securing performance for the completion of the road when, the pro when, when it's timely to do that. And and the, the applicant, after many years, this is like a 15 year project close to, I think, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, um, 13, 13 years. If, after many years now, coming, you know, getting closer to the finish line, um, there's, there's a, a, a change. We, I mean, whatever, we, that, the, the interest is in what's securing performance at the end of the day so that we don't get it. And that's it, that's all. I think, but but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we are interested in the value of the lot and what's sellable and what's not. But that's I think that's business. That's not planning board. I think that's the business. That I'd like to make a motion to continue this to our next meeting. You don't Unless, really need a I, I don't think we need a motion. Great. Um, Let's yeah. move on. So uh, <laughs> I just want to say that I think Aspistry. I think some value is important. This is why Amherst Hills gets that problem because maybe we need two lots now. I mean, if they're gonna have us redo the, so David, what this usually happens in the beginning of a subdivision. No, I, don't need, I don't need, I don't need the recap. No, 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 That's so the they're asking, over. I'm just saying <laughs> what information I feel I need from Mr. Reedy. Sure, so okay. if they're gonna have us re-step back into a covenant, well, it's gonna be today's dollars, not what was set up over 10 years ago, because we wanna make sure the road gets finished. So that's why I wanna know numbers. Um, so Chris, have that conversation with Mr. Reedy tomorrow and let us know, email or whatever, what's gonna happen or if it's coming on the, on the 15th or sooner mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. okay. So uh, we'll just move on to new business. Was there any new business, Chris? Item seven, five, sorry. No, not that I know of. Okay, good. Um, six, uh, ANRs. No ANRs. 
uh, ZBA applications? Oh, there are a bunch of them, but I can't remember any of them, and I don't have the sheet that tells me. Um, no. Nothing big, Pam. No, there's there's nothing big, and I don't have the sheet in front of me either. Okay. Um, when, when when is the next ZBA hearing on the um, Northampton Road project? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Thank you. Yep. Uh, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Nothing. Nope. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So um, section nine is planning board committee and liaison reports. Does anyone from, uh, well, maybe Michael, we do want to hear about what happened with your um, Right. CPAC. Uh, CPAC last night voted to rescind its approval of the million dollar uh, to be bonded recommendation for library and to request that the library return with a specific itemized uh, request devoted entirely to the uh, historic preservation aspect of the building, uh, including fire suppression and uh, uh, air conditioning uh, and uh, material storage. So that the the uh, the uh, the compromise that was was arrived at was to both rescind the million dollar recommendation and to invite slash request uh, the library to at its earliest convenience submit a specific detailed uh, proposal with with budgetary specifics. So you did end up having a meeting because last we had heard you weren't even yes. sure you could have yes. a meeting. Okay. Well attended, uh, many attendees. I'm sure. Okay. And what's the, so they'll submit that and then you'll meet again? Well, we assume they will submit that. We've invited them to do that. We don't know what they'll do, given the fact that the library process seems to be in a kind of holding pattern. Uh, I, my, our understanding is that the library has requested a one year delay uh, with the State Library Commission or the board that uh, is supplying the, the grant. Uh, so we don't know what the, how pressing things are at this point from either the library's point of view or the town council's point of view. Mr. Bockelman seemed to suggest that the town council would not be taking this issue up in the near future. So I don't know what that means. Okay, thanks for that update. Um, any other uh, committee updates? Um, uh, Michael, any other hands? I don't see any hands or just speak up. Okay, uh, report of chair, <laughs> it's um, 1050, so I'm gonna say no. Report of staff, Chris? No report. Um, we. I just wanted to note that Christine Grimullen and I had a plan to end this meeting at 10 o'clock. And we were going to be very strict about it, so we, <laughs> we ended we up not the best we could. We did the best we could. Yes, thank you all for sticking with us. I was hoping for ten thirty, so <laughs> I'm only twenty minutes past. But anyways, uh, do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Great. All in favor, just say aye. 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 All right, we're done. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night, all. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you all. Nice to see you all. <laughs>